thank you very much, Chad. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my, my presentation is about environmental attitudes among students in a post-cloud advocacy paradigm. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my paper or my talk is about environmental attitudes among students in a post laudatusi paradigm. So I'm going to compare transferees or the new students versus continuing or the uh, old students in the Catholic University in the Philippines. So let me uh, tell you about my background, uh, the background of this study. Uh, we all know that uh, Anthropogenic activities have uh, uh, destroyed ecosystems. Actually, there's a um, people think it's about it's the industrial revolution which started this uh, environmental disasters, but actually it's it started agriculture, uh, which started which uh, wreaked havoc in the ecosystems. And over the last uh, this uh, Holocene epic, uh, especially the last century. Scientific, uh, scientific studies have shown that greenhouse gases emanating from anthropogenic activity has affected climate patterns around the world. Most of us know that as a fact. Um, of course, this has culminated in, uh, uh, there, for, there was, uh, before the Paris Climate Agreement, there was the Kyoto Protocol, which talked about these greenhouse gases. And uh, over the years, scientists and governments have held dialogues on the issue of climate change. And lately, this Paris, uh, Paris Climate Agreement is the culmination of talks between governments and scientists within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, with, which deals with uh, greenhouse gases. But despite the uh, about 99% of the scientists agree uh, that the uh, climate change uh, is uh, the reason for the, uh, the global warming or the climate change is because of the greenhouse gases. However, we all know there are a lot of skeptics, especially the US President, uh, Trump. Um, uh, there, uh, there are some scientists, there's a minority of scientists uh, who try to look for something wrong with the data, and uh, this is highlighted by a lot of politicians, especially those in the uh, Western countries against the uh, need for uh, uh, to, to have a consensus on uh, climate change. So um, one of the uh, governments that are against uh, a consensus on uh, how to deal with climate change is the U.S. And uh, part of the reason is uh, uh, Trump won is on his uh, belief that the climate change is not caused by human activities. And this was uh, this is a view that is uh, accepted by most U.S. evangelicals. So there's a thinking in uh, in a lot of, or some of the Christian uh, denominations that climate change is not a real thing. Uh, uh, Dr. Maser talked about uh, in other uh, religions and cultures, there's a basically balance between uh, nature and uh, humans. However, um, some Christian thinkers uh, don't agree uh, in that way. So according to the Bible, uh, God gave humans dominion over the earth to, to care for it. Uh, so Christian thinkers think dominion means you have you have power, uh, overall power, to do whatever you want with the environment. But however, the original Hebrew word is uh, to take care, which doesn't mean dominion as we uh, understand the sense of uh, dominating over all life forms. So this is a view that is uh, um, most, Christi uh, most Christian evangelicals, like for example, James Watt, he was a uh, US Secretary of uh, Ronald Reagan. 
He viewed dirt as merely a temporary way station on the road to eternal life. The earth was put here by the Lord for his people to subdue and to use for profitable purposes on their way thereafter. So for um, some Christians and some uh, thinkers, they think that we have the authority to do whatever we want with, with the environment. And some U.S. evangelicals believe environmentalism is a native evil. In fact, this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, the reason why Trump wants the the support from uh, U.S. Christian evangelicals. So we are now at the crossroads of uh, cl uh, climate change. Either we do something now, we can reverse the effect of climate change, or uh, we don't do anything and it will um, wreak havoc in the ecosystem and the future generations will suffer from this. Uh, it's a good thing that we have a uh, Christian thinker and a leader of the Catholic Church, um, Pope Francis, who believed that there should be um, um, envir environmental ethics involved in uh, dealing with uh, there should be a care for the environment. And the uh, Climate Change Accords, uh, in an attempt to uh, influence the negotiations at the Paris Climate Change Conference, um, Pope Francis came out with an encyclical called Laudato Si, which means praise be. So it came from a, 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 a song or poem by Saint Francis of Assisi, the saint uh, of uh, that's very close to, to nature, and in it he called for uh, uh, praying for a positive outcome to the uh, to the present discussion, so that the future generation will not have to suffer the effect of our ill-advised delays. So uh, he was a uh, before he became the Pope. He worked as a chemical technology, so he is both a man of science and um, a man of uh, God. So he has made it possible to merge two worldviews, religion and science, to tackle care for the earth. So in Laudato Si, basically, uh, in Laudato Si, uh, basically, Pope Francis uh, agreed with the scientific data on climate change and eco-justice is connected to, the, to social justice. So the cry of the earth is also the cry of the poor. And it was a call for dialogue about the environment across, uh, across religions, countries, and cultures. So it's not about, he's not talking to the Catholics, he's also, also talking to all uh, cultures and countries. And it, uh, the Laudato Si is downloadable for free. Uh, for Catholic universities, Laudato Si is taken as a directive to further strengthen environmental values for all stakeholders in the institution. So not just students. We also need to develop uh, environmental values for the teachers. For They will be the one who will teach the students. And also there are the staff, there are the parents who are involved in molding the students. So. Um, Ecocentrism is also a worldview that uh, Pope Francis want to uh, instill in, uh, the, in, the, in the university as a whole. So how do we encourage and cultivate pro-environmental attitudes among these diver, uh, diverse group of people? So my work in the university, I am the environmental advocacy point person. So I uh, try to um, uh, I present activities that will help enhance uh, environmental attitudes and pro-environmental behavior among all the stakeholders in the university. So my problem uh, is basically uh, we, we uh, have new students, we have uh, the old students who have been there for a long time. So do we treat the student population as whole or do we give them different uh, activities. So that's basically my research question. So is there a significant difference between 
environmental actions between transferees, so those new or continuing, of those old students in St. Paul University, Quezon City, Philippines. So that's my research question. So what I did was uh, I took the whole population of grade 11 students. So this was around 197 students. And uh, I divided them into two. These are uh, those who are transferees or new students who came in from uh, other schools and uh, those who have studied before, so they're the continuing students. So I used the uh, questionnaire by Dunlap, the New Ecological Paradigm Scale. It was used to measure pre-environmental worldview. And I used the, for the statistical analysis, I used the ANOVA F-test, so to determine whether there's significant difference between the response of the two groups. Okay, if you read, uh, Okay, uh, the first question, uh, we are approaching the limit of the number of people of the Earth, uh, people the Earth can support. So you can see here in the variance, you can see the differences in opinion. Um, so as you look at the chart, you can see the varied opinions among uh, the students. So if it's, uh, the variance is low, that means they are basically in agreement, and it's, it's, if it's high, there, uh, there are a lot of opinions. So the Likert scale, uh, if you are familiar with the Likert, Likert scale, one, 1 to 5, so 1 uh, uh, highly agree, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the first question, uh, we are approaching the limit of number of people there can support, so you can see the variance is, uh, basically it's not one of the highest variance Basically, uh, we have a low variance between the transferees compared to the continuing students. And for human, uh, for the second question, humans have the right to modify the natural environment to suit the needs. A high variance between uh, transferees and continuing students. Third one, when humans interfere with, the na with nature, it often produces disastrous results. Okay, uh, that's the variance, as you can see. The next slide, you can see a low variance, meaning basically most students agree that human ingenuity will ensure that we do not make the earth unlivable. For the fifth uh, question on the Dunlap uh, NEP scale, humans are seriously abusing the environment. For the sixth one, the Earth has plenty of natural resources if we just learn how to develop them. We can see uh, basically agreement in both transferees and continuing students. Seventh, plants and animals have much as uh, right as humans to exist. Uh, normal variance basically. Uh, eighth, the balance of nature is strong. We have to cope with the impacts of modern industrial nations. Ninth, despite our special abilities, humans are still subject to the laws of nature. And the so-called ecological crisis facing humankind has been greatly exaggerated. So you can see a very high variance, especially among continuing students. Uh, this means a lot of uh, wide variable opinions there. Oh. Eleventh, the Earth is like a spaceship with a very limited room and resources. Well, humans were meant to rule the, uh, over the rest of nature. High variance of uh, basically uh, varied opinions among transferees and continuing students. The balance of nature is very delicate and easily upset. So they are basically in agreement with these questions, both uh, transferees and continuing students. 14 humans will eventually learn enough about how nature works to be able to control it. And the 15th question, if things continue on their present course, we will soon experience major ecological catastrophe. They're basically in agreement both the transferees and the continuing students. So I used uh, an F-test, an OVA F-test here, uh, for two sample variances. And the conclusion is, uh, there's no significant difference between the environmental attitudes between transferees uh, both new and old uh, students in uh, St. Paul University 
uh, Philippines. So I will continue on with these uh, researches and further studies will be done to measure environmental attitudes among employees, parents, and stakeholders. Uh, but the more, more important question is how do I transform this pro-environmental attitude? How does it this translate to pro-environmental behavior? So I will continue my researches along these lines in the university. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Chad. Um, can I ask, are there any questions or comments? Please, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, thank you uh, for your good presentation. Uh, actually, as, as you know, um, in Biden, uh, there are three kinds of approaches to environment. Uh, the first one is anthropocentric, the second one is stewardship, and the third one is maybe biocentric. As you told about the Francis of Assisi, he's the exponent of biocentric. Um, thought. But on the other hand, uh, stewardship uh, that is depends on uh, Sabbath principle. You know, there is a Sabbath principle in Bible. Yes, yes. Yeah, on the, uh, depending on this principle, uh, the stewardship has been developed uh, by uh, uh, Robin Atfield. Uh, he's, in, he, he's from uh, England. Uh, but uh, uh, I would like to ask you, from the very beginning of your presentations, you mentioned uh, a verse from Bible. Yes. Actually, I, I'm not sure whether there is a take care of. Actually, the verse may be 126, Genesis 126 and 28. There is a, the God created human beings as the image of himself. Then he has uh, given the right to subdue over the, all things, the birds and da, 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 everything. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm not sure if there is uh, a gap. Uh, uh, can you make confirm? There's a verse in the Bible, I think it said, after they were um, driven out from the Garden of Eden, they were uh, forced to uh, where's Marvin, I think he Maybe uses his Sir, Dr. Dr. Uh, Doc, uh, Ranel, do you know the verse? The uh, I think this was after the, the Adam and Eve were, uh, were driven out and now they have to take care of their own uh, great crops and to feed their own. I think that's chapter two or something. Okay, my second question is that, uh, do you think that uh, the student's attitude towards the nature or environment is uh, biocentric or uh, stewardship-like? I, I think it's uh, transforming because of this uh, Laudato Si and they were exposed to um, uh, seminars about it and uh, uh, a lot of activities like uh, tree planting and uh, uh, yeah. coastal cleanup. We, we, we do as a university, we try to instill environmental attitudes. Uh, young students want to do action uh, um, work so that it will instill values, environmental values in them. So, Is it like ecocentric? Uh, I think it's developing. Uh, if ecocentrism is uh, difficult if you do not have the lifestyle, so it has to be holistic. You have the parents involved, you have everyone involved. So I think basically they're moving to that ecocentrism from they realize that, yeah, our lifestyle is so anthropocentric and we're going to move towards that. So I think it's moving towards stewardship and hopefully a better balance is the ecocentrism. Uh, yeah, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Chad, I'd like to ask you, in the tradition of popes, uh, is this the most ecocentric pope that we've had? <laughs> yeah, I think um, like uh, most US evangelicals, uh, they're more uh, geared towards the spiritual matters. Uh, um, it's Pope Francis who realized, because of his uh, he took up the, the name uh, Pope Francis from St. Francis of Assisi. So he, he, uh, he made it an advocacy and he, he realized that uh, among uh, many religions, uh, I think Christian, uh, Christianity is more uh, anthropocentric than uh, other religions like Buddhism, um, Shintoism, and 
um, uh, other religions. Uh, Christianity is in fact uh, blamed for Western greed because they think dominion, they misinterpret dominion to, to, to mean that you can take over all lands, uh, even if there are people there. So uh, I think uh, Pope Francis is uh, moving the church into a, to an ecocentric uh, point of view. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chadwick. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Now, my paper is on philosophy and practices of bioethics across and between cultures. I'm going to cut it very short, but because I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. Now, only very recently, the whole world, all countries are becoming aware of overuse of advances in science and technology, where I'm mentioning biotechnology, resulting in environmental degradation, destroying all living organisms. All countries are experiencing why and how their cultures and practices have ignored and set aside their ancient philosophies, current philosophies, and uh, which valued nature and ecology, conservation and preservation of all living organisms for ecological balance. It is only if we have uh, ecological balance and if we allow all the living organisms to live and die on their own, there will be what you call no environmental degradation. There will not be environmental degradation and the earth will be safe for all countries, for all people to live. But we are not doing that. We have not done that so far. This realization has now shown people about nutrient cycle, about energy cycle, about biogeochemical cycle, between all organisms, between all forms of life, it should be. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Daryl mentioned about the sunshine. Without the sunshine, without water, without the proper climate, it's not going to be possible for all living organisms to live. Effectively, all organisms except human beings are dependent on natural resources. We are not the ones who are dependent on natural resources. Animals, birds, insects, bugs, even good bacteria, bad bacteria, they are all dependent on <coughs> the natural resources. Like other animals, man's chief source of food, which is potentially renewable, through growth of plants. So, and also protecting, safeguarding that we should not destroy wild, wild plants or plants from which we get food. There should be some limitation, that's what I'm arguing. Virtually, all of man's food is derived directly or indirectly from plants, but some of the energy used to obtain this food is obtained from sources that are not renewable. The most obvious of these are fossil fuels and minerals which is required for human beings. Man is dependent on these important sources of energy. Countries are becoming conscious of the various ways in which organisms are organized into communities. We are not the ones who are organized into communities, into different cultures, into different societies. All living organisms are getting organized into what you call communities. And how they exploit the available resources and how they respond to the environment, the restraints imposed by other members of the community, plants, microorganisms, animal communities, and by the environment, normally prevent any one of the species from becoming excessively common. Communities develop by passing through a series of successional stages, and the resulting climax depends on the characteristics of the environment, especially on the climate. If a plant or an animal community is disrupted by human intervention, if we are going to destroy, succession begins afresh and the new climax eventually established will definitely be different from the original. The relationship between species and non-living part of the environment has to be included in giving importance to acquisition of energy as well as transfer within the communities and the ways in which nutrients are obtained and utilized. And here I have mentioned the ability of the species to fit into the ecosystem. 
some of these species will fit into Japan, some of these species will fit into India, some of these species will fit into America. There is a choice, there is not selection, but they are compelled to choose. By species I mean animals, butterflies, birds, plants, wild plants, natural plants, and the plants which become food for us, or salad for us. That's what I'm mentioning. The inherited characteristics of genetic makeup of species that enable the plants and animals to survive show adaptations to the environment. Adaptations are distinct from adjustment to the environment made during an individual being's lifetime. Say, supposing there is going to be proper climate, cabbages will flourish. But if it is going to change, cabbages will become smaller, smaller, butterflies will become smaller, smaller. They will not be of the normal size, which we have seen. That's what I am mentioning. Caterpillars will turn into undersized butterflies. But if they provide their offspring nutrient properly, adequate nutrients, then they will again become of normal size. That is what I am mentioning. And I am showing pictures also. And because we introduced what you call agricultural technologies, say we are using chemical fertilizers, insecticides, pesticides, we are damaging, we are destroying so many insects, so many pests, and the new strain of crops and domestic animals. Animals and urbanization and industrialization by the use of biotechnology, I refer to Jeremy Rifkin, has resulted in widespread destruction of natural ecosystems and growing threat of soil and water pollution and ecological imbalance. People have understood that today in different countries and different cultures. And uh, now they feel that they should not destroy everything. They can destroy it in a limited quantity at a limited season. It should not be too much. But we are all doing too much of destruction of uh, insects, pests, animals, birds, everything. If only we come to the understanding that we will limit cutting down the trees, cutting down the wild plants, cutting down the plants which give us food and cutting down the animals, the sea animals, everything if you are going to cut down, the limit, I think, the earth will be safe for us. There will not be environmental disasters or damages or destruction. The earth will be safe place for both microorganisms, animals and for us. We are also animals. And that is the reason why I am mentioning UNESCO's declaration in 1975. It's only because of Darrell that we came to know about this. Because I met him only in 1998, not in 1975. But UNESCO's declaration in 1975 and Cartagino declaration 78 has been emphasizing biologies, love for all living beings. We should have love for not only our own children, our own families, but for all living things, not only for our human beings who are neighbors, who live in the same country, who are in the same cultures. But we should love everybody. We should love all living organisms. That is what he suggested. When I thought, what he is saying this? Love for all living beings. Love for all life. What does he mean? I used to wonder. <laughs> and I used to laugh. But then I understood. And I have mentioned animal rights on one column and conservation in the other column. I have drawn a table. Then I have gone for animal rights and animal welfare. Yeah. Concerned with animal, individual animals and with animals in general. Conservation focuses on levels above individuals, populations and species. I want you to read that. But it will be very difficult because it's, the bond is very small. And the first one, animal rights, refers usually to sentient animals, not necessarily to all animals. Just as jellyfish, sponges, 
and not to plants because plants don't talk but they have consciousness they are one single thinking one single brain to think to multiply to conserve to preserve themselves and to generate they have that we don't understand that and then i go to the third one concerned with animals in areas of human activity such as agricultural laboratories fur trade zoos circuses i think in japan also there is a circus where lion is there <laughs> lion dogs are there in your temples that is what i am going to describe in japan the question to be asked finally is we are exclusive in animal rights or welfare is or conservationist or for that matter an exclusive deep ecologist actually being one or another may be a difficult course that is a common for both the tables someone some animal welfare is not concerned about animals at all that is what i am saying in the next table we go to the next table animal rights and animal welfare that is there in japan also that is there in many of the countries animal welfare but not animal rights animal rights we should not invariably overrule animal interests for human interests we we'll go to the next table and uh, that is an animal holocaust how many animals are being killed every, every day for beef how much of cattle for meat how many number of horses for uh, meat geese again pigs chicken milk cows rabbits ducks turkeys cats i have given the numbers and uh, we will go to the next table when if it is there animal rights and animal welfare Yeah, before that, yeah, yeah, animal welfare. We can overrule animal interest for human interest. That is animal welfare. But real animal rights means you should not overrule the welfare of animals. But in most of the countries, we overrule. Second one will be we should not cause animals unnecessary pain or death. That is there. We should not inflict pain or death on animals. But we just overlook that. third one we should abolish animal use we should make stronger animal usage by prohibition laws that's all that is you should not hurt you should not give pain or you should not give death to too many animals that is all we can reduce it that is what we believe in we should not use animals to benefit ourselves as it is morally wrong but animal welfare they think that we should use animals to benefit ourselves because that is our right Animal welfare organizations are there like PETA and NHSUS. Animal welfare organizations are there as ASPCA and RPCA. We should always treat animals humanly. That is animal rights. But we are talking about animal welfare. We will treat animals humanly when it is convenient for us or when we like some animals. And I know in some of the countries, crocodiles in USA, crocodiles, lizards. very violent and uh, very bad animals are also brought up as pets <coughs> in usa now in japan cats and dogs or i'm sorry only cats in japan they are being treated as pets in india also you treat some animals as pets but if you want to eat them you kill them and you eat them rabbits that is happening in india also i'm not saying that indians are really very good that they are all uh, what you call uh, people who are following bioethics or who are following uh, the ancient religious philosophy the religious philosophy is there people read but nobody bothers to follow that is my uh, intention by presenting this paper so i am not just criticizing one country i am not criticizing any country i am just giving you what is happening in different countries different cultures but then i went away to animal ethics animal rights and animal welfare where the next 15 pages will be on philosophy <laughs> philosophy in our religions ancient religions in buddhism now in shintoism 
Shintoism also, seven horses are being taken in a chariot where the god sun comes in, where the sun rises, where the Japanese people also worship the sun god with seven horses who are driving the chariot. The same is there in India also. I have brought the pictures also. And uh, Christian theologians and uh, Hinduism, all these I have brought in. But let me uh, begin with the, what Christianity has said. Christian theologians also rediscovered the links between our dietary and spiritual choices. And searching Christianity and vegetarianism on the internet, it is easy to see just how important the idea of peace between all creatures. So it is not peace in the family. It is not peace between our neighbors or our country or our cultural people. There must be peace between all organisms. Saint Francis of ASI, SI, not only spoke eloquently about compassion for animals, but also taught that kindness to animals is good spiritually and promotes peace among humans. Then I go to Quran, Islam, where Quran was interpreted by Al Biruni when I mentioned that they showed kindness to beetles, butterflies, animals, pigs, pokes, rats, mice, reptiles, snails. Nothing is being eaten by the Islamic people. Rabbits are also forbidden by Shia Islam. Sunni Muslims eat whale's meat, but prohibit alcohol, blood drinks, coffee tea, sheep's, pig, pork, rats, snakes, crocodiles. Fish is not taken as a food by Egypt, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Kenya, and Northern Tanzania. <laughs> as well as East African people. Southwestern United States also, there is a taboo against fish and other water related animals including waterfowls. The same is there in uh, the uh, Judaism also, Israel. And I am saying that Koreans eat dog meat as well as in Germany and Mexico. Birds are eaten in many countries as well as their eggs. Robins are eaten in millions in Italy. Cyprus has 2.3 million robins per day. <laughs> Greeks, the number goes too much. France and Albania, Croatia, Libya, the number goes up. Also, <laughs> Mark Shrike, <laughs> Golden Oreo, owls are also being eaten in France, Spain also. Bears, ostrich, scavenger birds as vultures. They are also scavenger birds. <laughs> cleaning the toilet. They are cleaning the area. Crows and vultures. But they are also taken as food. In some countries they are avoided as food. In Iceland and Sweden, Western Finland, mushrooms are not eaten. In India and Rome, it is considered as delicacy, mushrooms. Guinea pigs and related rodents, capybara and paka are eaten in Peru, Pasto, Colombia, South Africa. USA kangaroo meat is banned. Monkeys of all types, internal organs of butchered monkey stand. And insects as well as kangaroos and turtles are also prohibited in Judaism or Israel. I think uh, I should go faster. Now if it is Hinduism, that is Kaimara, that is all Hindu gods and goddesses. One minute. Yeah, yeah, I'll go very quickly. All gods and goddesses are Kaimaras. Half animals, half birds are half animals and half humans. Or all their vehicles are birds. Or all their vehicles are animals. You can see the picture, if it is possible. Otherwise, I'll present it later on. Then we go to what are the dishes that are prepared in different countries. Banned dishes, 45 to 50 dishes are banned. And uh, weird dishes are there. I have presented only 25. And I have mentioned how you can see them, where from you can see them. I have mentioned that. And then I am going to the philosophy. 
Yeah, I'll finish off. I'm sure. going to philosophy. You want to show some pictures? Yeah. Can you show the pictures? Oh, yeah. This is banned around the world. See? Sassafras. It is a wild plant. From that they are making this soup or oil, whatever. You have to mix it with the uh, uh, vegetable salad. So that is prevented. That is banned. Next one. Ah. See, abyssinth, spirit, local liquor or spirit and soda are aerated with citrus flavors or with chemicals. That is not good for health. But we take that. Next one. See, chocolate, eggs. Next one. <coughs> Next one. Raw milk, that is also prevented in Canada. You should not take raw milk. You should boil it and only then you can take Samosa, which is there in India and I mean most of the countries, I think, that is made of a, a flour, rather, it is not good. Okay, next one, chips. It is only potato, but it is fried and it is, uh, what do you call, filled with what you call, some oil, which is not good. It is not just vinegar, it is oil. And if you are going to take too much of it, it will definitely affect your heart, respiratory system. Can you go to the next? See? Poi grass or goose liver or duck liver, they prepare. Poi grass, next one. Yeah, see, bread with potassium bromate, that is not good for health. We can take bread, but it should be different. Not potassium with bromate, it should not be that bread. Next one, yeah, this is again flame re retardant drinks. Next one, yeah, see, one, one second, I will see that. Ah. Farm raised salmon. It should not be eaten at all. But we have so many of us eat. Next one. See, that is tainted meat. You paint or taint the meat with color. That is not good. Next one. See, arsenic laced chicken. And this uh, lagoon chicken is too many in India. <laughs> Next one. See. Flame retardant drinks with chemicals, sodas and flavored drinks which people drink because it gives them some energy or some kick. The next one, Kazumazu. This Kazumazu, I, I think I have gone to uh, Holland and France where Kazumazu is cheese which will be blue, light blue in color. Inside that, maggots are alive and maggots are dead. When I tasted it, I knew something is wrong with that, I stopped taking it. But people take that. Kazu marzu. Okay, next one. See, Japanese puffer fish. Puffer fish is being cooked and people eat in some countries. Not just in Japan. And uh, this is also bovine or laced with RBH. RBGH. That is, they give hormones. This is robin. It is called ortolan. French robin bird. And then we go to the next picture. The Hinduism and Hindu gods will be there. Yeah, next. Number next. Yeah, pictures. Ah, yes. Ah, again, prevented food. No, it's not prevented. People eat. I, I think it is mentioned in, below that what it is. Little, little low. Put it up, put it up. Because the name is there below. Ah, uh, no, 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 because after that, after that, ah. Uh. I think we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the full paper is going to be about 50 pages. Yeah? Push it up, push it up. Huh? It's not moving, eh? It's not moving. Uh, next picture. Uh, next. I think it is written below there. On, uh, on the side. Just push it up. And come to the most uh, next one. Next one. 
still ants. Ants are being sent into the freezer. Black ants. And people eat ants with vegetable salad. In India also, I have seen people. When I ask them, oh my God, it is not for rich people. It is for poor people that we are giving this. I was wondering. <laughs> it happens in Chennai. I have seen that. <laughs> ah, now we can see the gods, goddesses. <laughs> Pratinkara, she is called with a lion face. Face is that of lion. Body is that of a human, woman. Next one. See, that is there. Sun god. It's not very clear. Yeah. Seven horses for the chariot. Next one. Yeah. You can see. The first one is. Uh, yeah. It is called uh, Sarabeshwara. Sarabeshwara means the face is that of a bird, the body is that of ox. And the next one, it is a cow. That within the cow, there are three gods and many more gods inside the cow. This particular cow called Nandini, she gives milk to everyone. Not here. In heaven. And the third one, see, with uh, snakes, ten snakes. The god, his face is that of a lion. He will kill Another Asura or people who are very, very violent. And the fourth one is the God who will uh, safeguard your death, human beings' death. He is called Bhairava, Kala Bhairava. Next one. Ah. The first one with a parrot's face, Sukha Munivar, we call him. He is a saint with a parrot face. And the next one, see, the snake is worshipping Ishwara or Lingam, God. It is a five-headed snake which is worshipping the God. And the next one again, the cow which has got the body of a woman and the face of a girl. And the fourth one, no, the first one again, Devas and some people who are in heaven, they are worshipping the God. Next one. Thank you very much. We, yeah. we do need to stop. I think I should stop. And uh, finally, I have given a list of where all, in which all countries, what all people eat, and in what all countries, because of the culture, certain things, certain animals, certain insects are banned, or they are not killed, they are not eaten. That I have mentioned in the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharina. Thank you. School of Social Science, Shotsubashi University in Tokyo. And I'm also a research fellow, senior research fellow at AUSN for American University of Sovereign Nations under the supervision of Dr. Daniel Mesa. Uh, today I want to talk about the one of the important concepts in bioethics, which is the human dignity. Uh, this is a very uh, outline of my talk. So first, I want to uh, explore this concept. Uh, what is dignity? Because we've been discussing in these two days uh, a lot of the ethical issues based upon the, the principles such as the respect for autonomy, the beneficence, or non maleficence or justice. But uh, I think the, the the underlying idea behind this bioethical principle, I think, is the dignity, respect for dignity. So how the concept of human dignity has been addressed in bioethics or discussed? So last I want to discuss this concept in relation to other ideas which I brought from the Eastern philosophy and Buddhism. So, uh, this book, uh, titled Human Dignity and Bioethics, was published uh, by the, uh, in the US. It's, this is a series of essays uh, written by a lot of authors, 
and academics in a wide range of uh, fields, including philosophy, ethics, science, and technology, and social science. And this book is very interesting. I think this is the, one of the first attempt to, to explore this concept in the field in the context of bioethics. And one of the fundamental questions that was addressed in this book is the, is the concept of dignity or human dignity, is it useful to, to, to regulate and deal with a lot of ethical issues from the enhancement to the uh, stem cell research or reproduction assisted reproductive technology or organ transplantation? Is it really, uh, does it work? Is it functioning well as the useful concept? Or is it a useless concept to deal with a uh, number of ethical issues? That's the question. Uh, but uh, in the end, I read this uh, book, but uh, in the end, this book uh, didn't give us the, the provide uh, appropriate answer to that question. So I want to explore more in my presentation. Now I will uh, uh, discuss the concept of dignity through literature, uh, especially through the writings of Kazuo Ishiguro. Do you know of him? Yes, uh, thank you. He got a, a Nobel Prize in literature yeah. this year. And his background is also quite interesting. He was born in Nagasaki. And, but uh, as a child, I think at the age of four or five, he moved to the England due to his father's job and at some point he he decided to become a, a UK citizen so he now he doesn't speak Japanese more and he is a very influential thinker and author in this contemporary society and he I'm fan of his novels and he like a lot of uh, he covers a lot of Topics and, for example, the, when we look at the, this book titled "Never Let Me Go," this is about the the bioethics. This is about cronies. This is about the organ uh, donation. So, I, if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend to read it. And in another book, this was published in I think 1989. Uh, titled The Remains of the Day, which has also become available in film, in movie. And in this book, in The Remains of the Day, the dignity, the concept of dignity was a key theme or idea. And this book is about the life of a butler called Stevens. In the in the uh, the old uh, war time in the UK, and throughout the life of Stevens, he he tries to uh, maintain and preserve the dignity. He showed it through his professional work as a butler. Mm -hmm. So for him, for Stevens, in this novel. To be a great butler means to have dignity, and which is in this novel is regarded as the essential ingredient of greatness, which I think is similar to when we look at the uh, uh, history of the the the, this, the concept in its origin in the Greek, the dignitas or dignity. It refers to something. It's something to do with being in, living in worthy, sense of worthiness or greatness. That's the kind of definition of this uh, original uh, concept. And Stevens in this novel said, dignity has something to do with the ability not to abandon the professional being, but that so he has a very strong image, strong idea about 
what it meant by dignity. And, but the irony is that because he has strong uh, professional ethos or as a battle and strong idea of dignity, in the end, in this novel, he failed to, to achieve the love relationship with uh, one lady. So looking back, he, looking back those old days, Stephen uh, said, what I thought about dignity was wrong. Because at, when he used to work as a butler in the place called uh, Darlington Hall in the UK, he, he thought the, having the affairs, having the relationship with a lady who worked with, together with the Stevens distract his professionalism, distract the, his idea of dignity. So he didn't say anything about his personal affairs to the lady, but uh, in the end he 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 thought it was it, it didn't go well. He thought that what he thought about dignity was not a good. So in Kazuo Ishiguro, he, he always in he, the interview he said, "I'm I'm not interested in what's happened, or we can say reality. What's happened?" The, I'm more interested in how he or see sees what's happened, or how people see reality. I think this quote is very important because dignity is always uh, considered something very <coughs> object, objective, in intrinsic or uh, intrinsic value by virtue of being humans. But the dignity, I think, in my understanding, it has all also has the uh, subjective dimension of our own cons the interpretation, how we see our own dignity. So, also this quote by Kazuo Ishiguro, uh, I found the similarity to the Buddhist teaching. For example, suffering. We've been discussing what is suffering here, but. Uh, Suffering, according to the one teachings in Buddhism, sufferings arise from the gap between this reality, how things are, and our approach to life. So there's a huge gap between what is happening right now and what we want to our life. So one way to escape from suffering is not to change this reality, but to try to change our way of thinking, our way of understanding of this reality, what is happening right now. So our subjective dimension is also important, I think, when we think about human dignity. So when we look at the uh, uh, human dignity in the context of bioethics, uh, it has been referred to in many international guidelines or document. For example, in the Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights, which was made in 2005, human dignity are to be, to be fully respected. And also in the Article 12, it said, the importance of cultural diversity and pluralism should be given due regard not to be invoked to infringe from human dignity. So I, what I find it important in this article is that cultural diversity should be respected as long as it doesn't violate the human dignity. So when we look at this article, we can say that human dignity is more important than the respecting the cultural diversity without Respecting the human dignity, uh, we, can, we cannot respect the cultural diversity. So it's, now, as you know, it's the concept of dignity is used in the legal document as the foundation of human rights. So we never understand human rights 
without human dignity. In the same way, we never understand human dignity without human rights. So although the relationship between the two, relationship between human rights and human dignity is debatable, but I think uh, these, these two <coughs> concepts are quite important. So in science and research, as I already uh, told you, it's often considered as in something to do with inherent dignity, intrinsic value. We, uh, we have been created in, in Christianity in the image of God. Right? Here, the dignity, the notion of dignity arise. But uh, I think it also has the subjective dimension, which is our way of understanding our individual's perception of dignity. So unfortunately, when we look at the history of Western, many of the Western philosophers, uh, human dignity is understood merely in terms of the our rational, rationality to, to make a, a plan for the future and to implement it. But uh, to me, it's very, if we understand dignity only this way, it's very, a uh, narrow way of viewing, it's misreading, it's misunderstanding. To me, the dignity, or human dignity, is more than that. It's a broader concept. And it's more about the, it's about the relationship, for example. It's about interdependency. We did the same thing can be said for ethics. Ethics, we now, today, nowadays we say the bioethics, medical ethics, medical, uh, media ethics, environmental ethics. Ethics is very seen in a very narrow sense, but to me, ethics should be considered maybe in broader context. Ethics is something to do with how how we live, how we coexist together in uh, with nature, for example. It's it's about relationship with uh, humans and nature, humans and humans. So it's more broad to me. So there's so some ideas to reflect upon the concept of dignity. In Occidental philosophy, normally, something called A or B, C or whatever has its own substance. But this idea is not present. This idea is invalid in many of the Eastern thought, in Eastern philosophy or traditional thought. The substance of beings and things doesn't come or arise in, for example, in Buddhism, generally. And A and B, or I and U, are co-arising, co-existent, and cannot be separated. So we are always in the Buddhist term what we call the interdependence co-arising. We are being in, in this interdependent co-arising. So the same thing can be said for time and space. Yesterday we had a, a very philosophical discussion on time. Normally we, we say we don't have time. I, I, meet, I, I'm, I don't have enough time. I, my flight back to Tokyo is, is coming soon, so I have to <laughs> finish my presentation soon. But uh, that's the objective time. That's the, when we say time, normally it's understood as objective quality. But time also has subjective dimension. Time is, we live in time, and time is in us. That's the subjective dimension of time. So time and space are one and the same thing. We cannot separate the two. So to me, the most of the uh, uh, philosophy, philosophy Eastern traditional Eastern soul, uh, we can call it the non-dualistic. Non and so subject and object are one and the same things. So what is, for example, what is enlightenment? That's practice. What is practice? That's enlightenment. So what is life? That is death. What is death? That is life. Because without life, there is no such thing. Uh, without life, there is no such thing as death. Without death, there is no such thing as life. 
So always in a relationship, always we cannot separate the two. So if you find difficulty in understanding what I said, I recommend this book uh, titled A Tale, A Tale for the Time Being, written by the Ruth Ozek. Uh, she's a Japanese American living in Vancouver, Canada. <coughs> and based upon the Eastern thought, namely Buddhism, she, she wrote a very interesting book about what it means to live in time. Well, what, what's it, what is it to, to live in time and time in us? So he, uh, she said, in this novel starts with this narration. Hi, my name is Nao, and I'm a time being. Do you know what a time being is? Well, if you give me a moment, I will tell you. A time being is someone who lives in time, and that means you and me and every one of us who is or was or ever will be. So, as I said, the notion of I, the first pronoun, I, is I only if the others exist. I am I because you are you. That's the, that's the connection or relationship that we used to have in the in many uh, Eastern countries. And so this uh, living in time, this idea, is, I think is useful for the, uh, when we also think about the dignity. So in conclusion, dignity can be regarded as a central concept in ethics, bioethics, science, and policy, but it can be interpreted as both the subjective and objective Phenomena. So the way of understanding human dignity affects the way we see the biological issues. So here I put some questions for the discussion. First, do you think that human dignity is a useful concept to govern the conduct of research in science and medicine? Or is it a useless concept to work as merely a slogan that camouflages and convincing argument or biases. So if we have time, I don't have time, but uh, if we have time, I'd like to address this question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we do have time for a question. Anybody like to take the time? <laughs> we have a philosopher of time, Professor Ozaki. <laughs> Any questions on time? <coughs> Okay, yes, one. Very nice uh, presentation. Are you a uh, student at Hitosubashi University? Yes. Uh, which is your major? Uh, for, I'm currently in the doctoral program, the oh. PhD candidate, but for my master I was in the program of social science, sociology. Oh. Major in sociology, but I also took some courses in philosophy, and particularly the uh, Eastern, I mean the Buddhism. Oh. And, and so I'm always curious about the comparison between the Western and Eastern oh. thought. So. Yeah, especially uh, what is uh, philosophy of process? is uh, uh, mainly concentrated on time uh, dimension. So this is very uh, significant for your consideration. And contemporary uh, cosmology, astronomy is uh, also uh, very beneficial for your consideration of time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hassan, yes, please. I mean, personally, I wanted to comment from my sociological point of view. I mean, the concept of, the, you know, in sociology, you are a sociologist yourself, there is a, what you call a positive, positivistic approach to concepts, whereby there's something that I'm used to call a social fact. 
the other words, culturally or in a particular community, a particular family, there is a way they consider what is dignity. That's why you find in some religions, when you are Muslim, you can't marry a Christian, or there are certain things you can't do because the family, the community, the culture consider that against the social fact. At the same time, you have what we call phenomenology, in other words, you interpret the thing the way you know it. A church, from a social fact, is supposed to be a place for worship. But there are people who go to church on Sundays, not because they want to worship, but they want to meet somebody there. And if you want to know why she or he goes to church, you must ask her. Because you might assume, because the social fact, the church is a place for worship. But people go to church or the supermarket for different reasons. So the concept of dignity also is a class issue. There are certain places where if you belong to a particular class, social class case, you can't marry somebody who is below you because it's against or below your dignity. So it's not say something which is neutral. It depends whether you take it from a class perspective, from a positivistic perspective, from a phenomenological. So you as a sociologist, I mean, you might need to take those issues into account. You know something which is there, I mean, you interpret it the way you want, depending from what perspective. Their family dignity, their uh, religious dignity, all a packet of things, depends on which point of view you take it. Yeah. I think, yeah, thanks for the time again. The, depending on the, <coughs> the, the perspective you have, it may, the interpretation may change, I think. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm running out of time. Um, thank you. Or, we still have time. Thank you very much. You still have time. It's up to God if you have time or not. Uh, thank you. Plan to come to the Kumoto Bioethics Roundtable from the Nepal uh, in the previous time, uh, well, several times ago, but they had a major earthquake. So it's great that uh, you were able to come. To this, uh, thank you, Amrit. Namaste, everyone. Uh, this is Amrit from Nepal, and uh, this could be a different uh, subject in this platform. Uh, I have been involving in hotel industry since last 10 years and uh, I'm gonna present a uh, small short presentations on the role of ethics in hospitality and uh, tourism industry. Uh, why the tourism and hospitality industry is important for the country and uh, what kind of ethical problems are facing their daily operations. Uh, as we all know that uh, tourism is currently one of the top industries driving the global economy uh, with all countries having an increased opportunity to play a part either as the source of market or the tourism destinations. Despite that, there is a growing concern of ethics in both the hospitality and tourism industry as these uh, professionals are faced with lots of ethical dilemmas in their daily operations. By nature, tourism industry products to a large extent depend on cultural and environmental resources. The industry involves activities that are increased, that are continuously interacting with nature. Tourists' interest to visit different places leads to increased clearance of various natural areas for the purpose of developing hotels and resorts. Organic and solid stays produced by the hospitality industry may contribute to environmental pollution. In addition to the interactions with natural systems, tourism activities involve both direct and indirect contact between local community and tourists. Like uh, agro-tourism and eco-tourism involve direct interaction, whereas mass tourism has the lesser direct involvement. In both situations, however, contacts between host community and the tourists cause various problems such as importation of new cultural and lifestyle, over commercialization of cultural commodities and conflict of values. Most of these problems are ideally ethical in nature as they lead to pollution, economic imperialism, environmental degradation, depletion of natural resources, always sexual abuse. As a result of these numerous ethical issues, there has to be a global acknowledgement of the need to think about the concept of sustainable or responsible tourism. I am trying to uh, focus on the like uh, 
sustainable and then the responsible two forms of tourism. The sustainable tourism is it is that which creates better places for tourists to visit and local community to live in. This form of tourism will broaden the concept of sustainable or ecotourism to include environmental, ethical and social considerations. Similarly, the responsible tourism is the form of tourism which is related with all type of tourism that refrains to the destination, cultural and natural environment and the interest of all involved parties. It will reduce harmful environment, social as well as economic impacts and will create more economical benefits for the host community and improving the overall interest of the destinations. Ethical principle in, includes integrity, fairness, honesty, respect, attitude, leadership, accountability, loyalty and trustworthiness. Promoting these values in hospitality and tourism industry may cost some money in short term but they are likely to contribute to the long term success of the organization as well as the better future of the nations. While talking about the attitude, uh, I have faced in incident in my hotel just a few days back or oh, couple of yeah few days back uh, there was an incident uh, we had a guest from the United States and uh, he had placed an order for one fish but uh, when our colleagues uh, served him then that was the chicken but uh, he cannot have chicken and this is the like a big problem in the hotel industry like is the five star hotels. If you have this problem and if you make a complaint to the management, then the person who prepare the food and the person who serve that food, this person will be terminated like right away from the job. And what happened like uh, he didn't complain, we apologize to the guest. Uh, he didn't complain, we solved him like, the, like whatever he wants. And uh, later when he mentioned a comment, like the staff was superb. He didn't mention about the food, he just said the staff was superb. So like nothing happened and the staff was like instead rewarded because he mentioned the staff was superb. Like uh, the attitude and then the uh, attitude that the shows by the staffs that uh, leads him to get the rewards instead of the like uh, he gets terminated from his job. So, hospitality professionals is faced with an ethical dilemma of whether to give priority to profits or the customers. Ethics have a positive relationship with profits and overall success of an organization which will definitely help a country to move ahead in best economic conditions. Creating a strong ethical environment in those sectors can result in increasing a flow of the tourists from different parts of the world, which leads a country to a successful destination and one of the greatest in the world. Now I am in conclusion. Ethics is essential in every aspect of life. Ethics will reflect the nature of the person as well as the organization. In the hospitality and tourism sector, ethics will play a vital role to lead the organization towards the successful way. Hospitality and tourism industries are the base source of economy of the nation. It will drive the nation to the development, prosperity and peace. To build up and improve these industries, attitude and the behavior of the person who does involved in this sector is very crucial. For example, if a manager of the company leads the team with a good attitude, equality and respect to the fellow staffs, then the outcome of the staffs will be productive which may keep the reputation of the industry will be high forever. Since the tourism sector is one of the pillars as well as the motivator of the nation in terms of the sources of economy, the ethical attitude and the behavior of the persons attached with the sector will play an extreme role to guide it to greater success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any uh, questions or comments? I would love to have more of the comments than the questions because uh, <laughs> this is my first time the able uh, international presentations and I hope you like it and because of the sort of the time like uh, I need to run away to Koga.
So that's what I informed to Professor Masses to make my presentation a bit earlier. Okay, do you have uh, questions or comments? Is it uh, ethical tourism? Okay, well, Hassan, well, Amr, what is ethical tourism as opposed to unethical tourism? Can you give us an example from the pool of unethical tourism? So it's uh, like uh, uh, two types of tourism. Like tourist does not mean like uh, they all are good and they all have the, like uh, uh, one uh, motto to visit the places. Some of the tourists, some of the guests who go to visit the places, they might have the, like a different kind of thinking. So like uh, the ethics, ethics that both is necessary for the tourist, the guest and the, the staffs for both of them. Hassan, you had the same question. Yeah, but I mean the question oh, here yeah. is, can you clarify to me, I mean when the you know the hotel or the hospitality industry has its own ethics, its own principles. values. Yes sir, it does America. have... No, no, I'm not finished. I've got its own values. And here you find the American guest, perhaps he behaved the way you did because of the way you approached him, apologized before it went and you took that as something positive. So I mean, how do we explain that? Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, he was impressed, that is how we approached to him. Once he got the wrong order, he was uh, impressed the way we behaved, the way the staff behaved to him. And then uh, he didn't mention that's what. Otherwise, it could have been a big problem. And even like uh, what kind of uh, like system the five star hotel has is, if the guest complain, guest is always right. We have these principles. Guest is always right. If the guest complains, then uh, like uh, the staffs will be has to be like go and then he he or she has to give the explanations. <coughs> and uh, if it's uh, like a big issues, then uh, you might be terminated from the job. So it's very important, like showing the good attitude. But, but don't you think that the concept of uh, the guest is always uh, right? It's almost mm -hmm. like a, a cliche in the sense that it's not always that the guest is always right. Yes, but it's, it's something. For yes, me. but the, the principles we have, the hotel industry has, is the guest is always right. Okay, Maya. Uh, I think I just wanted to ask, I see if you just wrote here in your abstract, the impact that the hotel has on the environment and the community in which the hotel is located. What kind of ethics does the hotel maintain? Because it's, some people might see it as a big building, a big cement block in the middle of a community. Um, so how does the hotel industry, hospitality industry reconcile its impact on the environment and how does it incorporate community into its activities? Uh, it's not like the hotel industries they can produce the things and uh, like uh, they do have the loss of like uh, wastes and uh, which makes uh, like a negative impact to the communities. Like uh, the wastages cause the pollutions and lots of things. Then the hotel has the consideration. Hotel should have to have the considerations like uh, how to uh, like make less like a wastages and how to deposit it in the like uh, related areas. Mm -hmm. So that is how like the hotel industries are doing mm -hmm. in the bar. Yeah, I mean, don't you think sometimes uh, the hotel or the hospitality industry can bring ethical values which are contradictory to the values of the surrounding community? Prostitution or uh, allow people to do what they want. For instance, we live in a Muslim background where women are not allowed to wear shorts, whatever they are. But because of uh, money and the pay, they do what they want. It happens in many countries. Mm -hmm. 
and she hates the, the values and the feelings of the local community. But the government allowed her because it brings money. This should, uh, this should, like uh, the hotel I am working, like uh, they are uh, taking care of one of the orphans' house. Like uh, every day, like they taking the meal to them, and uh, that is how they coordinate with the community, the hotel, like the management, they coordinate with the communities, and uh, even the like they look after some the like orphans' house, and uh, that is how they do. Okay. Uh Okay, uh, last question, I think. Marlon? Okay. Um, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Um, I think that's our first time to have a paper on tourism <laughs> ethics. I don't know, ethics tourism, I think we have. But you know, it's very important that we focus our attention also to ecotourism. Uh, development and management uh, to to decide on ethics of ecotourism. I think sometime in 1999, there was the world uh, there was the world code of ethics for tourism. Uh, I don't know if hotel industries are aware of it, but it was adopted by the World Tourism Association in 1999. A uh, part of it is already a code of ethics for ecotourism and hospitality management. Uh, there are, I think, 10 or 14 ethics principles in the code. I don't know if hotel owners, although their primary interest is the business, even ecotourism's primary interest would be business for the state because we gain money from it. But I'm not, oh, I'm sh I'm not sure if uh, hospitality industry owners are aware of the code if there is any policy that a particular hotel should comply with the code in Nepal, if the hospitality industry is even aware of that code that was made in 1999, in many other organizations, there is a code and we are required to comply with the code. Now, there was a code and if it is adopted in all countries, all member countries of that association, then it is expected that all hospitality industry owners comply to the code. Uh, one of which is the ecotourism should not violate the rights of the people who are originally in that place. Yes. Now, is that also implemented? Are, is the hospital industry aware of the code? Do they have a code this, that is compliant to this 1999 code in Nepal? Talking about the code? The code of ethics. Code, uh, code of ethics. For yes. hospital, for tourism. Yes, they do have like a certain standards. They should follow that, like uh, uh, whenever like uh, the guests come to the hotels, uh, the like uh, tourist destination, then you should have to follow some certain standards and uh, you should maintain it. Like it's uh, like uh, internationally, like the hotels I'm working is international hotels and uh, wherever you go around the world, the staffs are following the same standards. Do you have environmental fee for every guest in your hotel? No. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well done, Amber. Thank you, Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Master, for, me, for providing me such a great platform to be here with you mm -hmm. and uh, to be here with all of you. It's my great pleasure. Hope uh, you like my presentation and uh, hope I'll get the good comments. And thank you very much. Uh, I'm leaving to Fukuoka now. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Can I get you a bit? The, the four like that. out of uh, five uh, papers for this conference on uh, uh, traditional uh, healing or indigenous knowledge systems and practices. So yesterday morning, uh, we have our second speaker who presented uh, indigenous knowledge practices. And the uh, shaman uh, from Korea. And then this morning, also on uh, indigenous knowledge systems of uh, Africa. So we were able to uh, lay down the the uh, indigenous uh, bioethics principle and uh, practices. Uh, by the way, uh, I am my discipline is uh, anthropology, uh, cultural anthropology. So I'll be focusing on the narratives on uh, on this. Uh, so I will be uh, focusing my uh, presentation, the narratives on uh, 
displacement and disease. So another form of disease is uh, displacement. So disease, so when you are at ease, you are healthy, but when you are sick, uh, it's related to place. So if you are displaced, it's a sign of uh, being uh, unhealthy. So I'd like to uh, connect this with uh, uh, the occasion of uh, traditional healers uh, in the uh, northern Philippines. So I'd like to uh, begin with uh, this uh, famous uh, quotation. So I'd like to, uh, to emphasize the, uh, the location of uh, these uh, healers because uh, according to this author, uh, Simon Whale, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. So uh, the need for context, the need for uh, the place where I'm going to discuss uh, my paper. And uh, basically, uh, that's why I'm uh, what interested me to uh, make a study on this uh, in, uh, traditional leaders are the marginal places in uh, the Philippines wherein uh, undiscovered. So first is the uh, the context here. So the the the, ge the, the, the geographical context of my study is located up north uh, in the Philippines. So that's the, we call that the Fuga Island. Fuga in Latin is escape. So um, that's the meaning. And uh, unfortunately, this place is being uh, developed under a uh, uh, special uh, economic zone. So it's uh, the people there are being uh, threatened by the regional economic development. So. Uh, I'm going to uh, present uh, what are the the, uh, the the emerging role of these uh, traditional healers. So, by the way, I was able to uh, get a master plan of uh, the development uh, in the island. Uh, so it says here, Fuga Island will be converted into a little Hong Kong. So that's the development, and they're going to displace uh, more than uh, 3,000 uh, people there. So people are questioning seed development or displacement. So my framework uh, for this study is uh, very simple. It's about uh, what's the landscape, storyscape, and mindscape. So I started to look at the, the landscape, the, the importance of a uh, place, how these uh, uh, traditional healers uh, look at their place. Okay, so through the lens of these uh, healers, uh, the study articulates the, the experience of being placed and displaced brought about by this aggressive development in the island uh, that somehow questions their uh, self-identity and uh, well-being. So if you look at it's a short uh, uh, geography about the island, it's almost uh, 10,000 hectares, it's quite long. And then uh, the indigenous uh, communities there, the, the, ethno, the ethnic group, are the Ilocanos, 2,500. And then, uh, if you look at its uh, history, the story scape, uh, from its uh, pre-colonial history, they are there in that island. Aside from the uh, burial jars traditions, they also have the traditional healers. So, they're claiming that uh, they have the right to live in that island for many generations before them. Because to date, from its modern history, they are being threatened to be dispelled, to be uh, uh, disposed in this island, to be removed from that island because of this uh, ongoing uh, uh, economic development. So they are trying to convert this uh, island into sustainable tourism and leisure development, just like a template of uh, a mini Hong Kong. For Mindscape, I think uh, they believe that the, the people believe that uh, they have the right to, to own the, their lands, their, their houses, but the, uh, the poverty condition that island is uh, um, onerous, and then uh, it has a security guard, but from their, uh, from their 
narratives they look at the island from this uh, four uh, from the from the narratives i summarize them into four uh, major themes so they look at the island as a source of identity it's a mother providing them solitude freedom uh, they look at the island as nature and uh, as a gift so those are the dominant themes from the narrative so what are the role of the uh, these uh, traditional healers so i was able to uh, interview the whole island uh, 15 of them uh, majority male and i think they have uh, four uh, women and each village there are six villages uh, has uh, their own uh, uh, traditional healers or we call that herbolario so i interviewed them but uh, what prompted them to uh, heal in their island so first they were uh, convinced that they had, they had the vocation to heal. They have the, the calling. So it, it, it appears in dreams. And uh, aside from dreams, um, it was passed to them from generation to generation. So majority of the, uh, the community, the locals, look at them as uh, a constant refuge. So these are the prominent roles that they were able to identify in the study. So, um, the, uh, the people's belief of the sacred, of good and evil, of order and harmony, of the cause and meaning of uh, illness in the island, of suffering and death, are derived from the articulation of the traditional healers. And then, mandate from God through dreams and their uh, great ancestors, the healers shape and influence the life world of the community. They have a very uh, strong influence on the life world, philosophy, belief system of the community. And they also facilitate the healing process that on the healing process of the community through meaningful meaningful explanations of the causes of their illness. So not on uh, the so-called um, ethnomedicine uh, in contrast with biomedicine. There's no biomedicine in the island, only uh, ethnomedicine. Another role, so rituals and practices bring forth healing and wholeness both uh, physically and socially uh, through them. Uh, communal values of the island are uh, reiterated, reinforced, uh, especially the solidarity or bayanihan in Tagalog. Uh, difficulties are shared and transcended through them. And then the spirit or value of solidarity is uh, fostered or uh, rendered. So the healing traditions in this island, if you look at them, uh, they believe that the island is uh, inhabited by ancient spirits both uh, good and bad. So the island is a source of uh, healing and at the same time, source of uh, illness also because it's uh, being inhabited by uh, both uh, bad and good spirits. So the healing traditions in the island by these uh, healers, uh, they have strong emphasis on uh, spiritual healing, uh, which is an inseparable uh, component of all healing. So basically the healing is, since they are promoting ethnomedicine, they ritualize uh, the, the healing process, so it's uh, uh, quite uh, holistic. So the way they diagnose their uh, their patients, they have this uh, uh, diagnosis uh, method. Uh, I was able to uh, uh, to identify uh, four. So the the oraciones, and then the talado, tapo, and uh, santigua. So these are the the way they uh, diagnose. Uh, their uh, patients every time uh, the sick members of the, the community uh, come to them. So, uh, among others. So, for them, uh, the, the he healing is effective if uh, the sick person is socially restored in the community. So, not only individual, but also uh, uh, the, the restoration of uh, relationships in the community. So, uh, that's uh, quite uh, holistic. So healing boils down to meaning and the transformative uh, transformation of experiences of the sick members of the community. So when we talk about uh, effective health and care and wellness in the island, uh, these traditional healers understand uh, the patient well perspective, their worldview. And then uh, the healers interaction with all the members of the sick family. So during the the healing process, uh, 
members of the community, members of the villagers are involved. So it's uh, they, they, they ritualize the uh, the healing process. That's why uh, it's ethno medicine. And they believe that it's up to Joseph or God who heals them and their community, so it's their faith. And then the family members and their neighbors participate in the ritual. So just to affirm uh, from the study of uh, Winkelmann uh, on uh, medical anthropology, that the ritual practices heal by meeting fundamental human needs for belonging, comfort, and bonding with others. Rituals integrate and bond people, enhancing social support systems, group identity, and self-development. Community bonding elicits biologically based attachment processes, facilitating adaptive change and healing for individuals and groups. So I listed some. So if you look at the uh, the role of these traditional healers, it's not only uh, uh, not only uh, biological uh, sickness, but it's more than that. They also uh, involved in the socio-economic and political issues of the island. So, one uh, traditional healer is involved in preventing the ongoing illegal table poaching. And then uh, for them, they need to affirm that the island is a gift to them. They need to teach that to, to the young uh, generation. And then the enactment of uh, local ordinances, they facilitate. And then. For them, the entire island is uh, a cure, and at the same time, it's also a source of uh, illness. So I also interviewed uh, these uh, traditional healers, and what were the transformation that happened to them in the personal and communal level? And uh, it's very good to look at the, their uh, transformation. So from the uh, communal, you can see that uh, they were able to express uh, the value of solidarity, I think uh, that's one, uh, one, one strong value. And then the uh, restoration of relationships and wellness in the community. And then Bayanihan uh, and Damayan for Solidarity also. And then these healers serve as uniting force in the village, particularly in times of uh, hardships and uh, illness. Because biomedicine, capsules, tablets, uh, are scarce in the island. Uh, it's not available, so they need to rely on the uh, community resources, including the the, the plants and uh, these uh, traditional healers. So to summarize, uh, the significant role of the healers in promoting and keeping the well-being of the community amid its internal and external economic threats. So they played a significant role not only in. Uh, um, physical healing, but almost all issues of the community. Their view of illnesses and their cure is uh, encompassing. It's not uh, only personal, but also ecological, social, spiritual uh, dimensions. Since the island is uh, regarded as offering cure, as well as a source of illness, protection of the island is also integral to healing. So they involve the community in the rituals, thereby facilitating the healing process through meaningful explanations of their illnesses, influencing their behaviors and reinforcing values of the community. Since the, this the ongoing threat uh, in the island uh, being uh, displaced, so the impending relocation of the community, these healers are the people's resources and refuge in times of uh, crisis. So I think uh, this is, that's, the, that's the, the political challenge now, how going to uh, to uh, uh, consider uh, these uh, resources, this heritage, these healing uh, traditions of uh, this community. With that, uh, I thank you. Thank you. It's very, uh, very interesting. Um, some comments or questions? Is it similar to other countries? Uh, yes, please. Brian. Uh, good afternoon. Yes. Can it be said that it is the relative poverty of the people that forces them to seek uh, these uh, natural, natural healers that are going to the more advanced uh, clinics in order to cure their ailments? Yes, uh, that's true. So it's uh, poverty related. At the same time, it's because of the geography of uh, the place. No, it's an island. So it's very, very difficult to transport their uh, sick uh, 
uh, families to the mainland. So there are the documented cases that by way of uh, transport them, bringing them to the mainland, uh, the the patient uh, died already. So there are many cases like that. And then the infant mortality is uh, very, very high in that uh, island. So what we are proposing, proposing is to uh, maximize uh, community process, including this, the traditional healers and their medicines. Can it be said that if there is availability, for instance, of more advanced uh, medicine in the place, then the attitudes of these people who go to traditional healers might change, and so therefore they would seek the more scientific uh, type of medicine in order to like, uh, cure whatever ailments that they have? I think definitely uh, they will uh, change the perspective. But uh, what we're advocating is, uh, along with these biomedicines, all these capsules, uh, I think the local resources must also be emphasized, which is this uh, so-called uh, ethnomedicine, because it's not only cure. Uh, the, the, the concept of cure is not only biologically, not only physically, but it reinforces uh, uh, healing of relationships, uh, community relations, and values of solidarity, and uh, respect for human rights. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's really uh, interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Three sisters can present. that apply values to the practice of clinical medicines in scientific research. Aims to guarantee quality and principal care to all individuals without discrimination by age, sex, race or religion. Aim of the presentation. This presentation focuses upon ethical challenges faced in infidelity treatment through different medicine, med medicine systems in India. What and why? Infertility is the inability to conceive after attempting to achieve pregnancy for one year. It occurs in about 10% to 15% of couples in general, although this is increasing in recent times. It is a result of physiological and anatomical problems in either partner. Current increases are related largely to changes in lifestyle, environment and pollution. Because the Siddha system or you know, I studied in Tamil only. Now only the uh, Tamil Nadu government uh, under the English. But uh, when, I when I was studying that in Tamil only. So what are the causes, infertility causes? Male 30%, female 30%, combined 10%, unexplained 25%, other 5%. Because, but the infertility is not a disease. It's a disorder only. But so many people are bothering about too much of about this, like uh, cancer, heart attack, and the cardiac problem, cardiac, like that they are bothering about this too much. 
So not, uh, uh, it's not a great disease. It's only a disorder only. Prevalence. One in every four couples in developing countries have been found to be uh, affected by infertility. Common causes for infertility may be agisphomia and oligo, uh, magisphomia, oligosphomia, vas block, ericosis, hormonal deficiency, and genetic disorders. Female anovulation, fell off in tube block, endometriosis, fibroid uterus, PCOD, hormonal imbalance, anatomical abnormalities, and genital disorders. Treatment and procedure allopathy practitioners, male infertility, hormonal therapy to increase bone box, female infertility, medication to stimulate the ovaries to ripen and release eggs, surgery to resort pregnancy of obstructed fallopian tubes, artificial insemination which involves the woman being inseminated with husband or donor sperm, invert of fertilization, fertilization IVF in which eggs are removed from the woman, fertilized and then placed in the woman's uterus by passing the fallopian tubes. Treatment options, so many that you have the uh, assistant reproductive technologies, uh, example IUI, ICSI, sperm extraction, gift, gift, IVF, etc. Yeah, I have to uh, IVF. IVF, I mentioned. Uh, treatment procedures, key differences, allopathic medicine, Use of high dose of steroid hormones to stimulate the system. Indian medicine aims to identify, identify to the root cause of identify and address it. Allopathic system the symptomatic focused and literally and against bound to achieve fertilization. Indian medicine uses a combination of diet lifestyle modification and personalized medication to, re to restore balance in the body. Allopathy medicine involves invasive investigations including surgeries that carry to risk to health. Indian medicine does not involve surgery or inv and invasive <coughs> investigations, investigations draws on advances in modern medicines to support care. Allopathic medicine are also associated with increased risk of adverse health, adverse health outcomes for patients around diabetes, hypertension, cancer and coronary artery disease. Indian medicine improvements in body mass, the index and overall well-being achieved prior to conception as a result to holistic treatment. Allopathic medicine, pregnancy is conceived through AOT considered as a high-risk pregnancy. Indian medicine, pregnancy is conceived through Indian medical treatment is not considered as a high-risk pregnancy by default. I am not criticizing the allopathic medicine system or any medical systems. What I am, I, 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 I want to tell you, I want to tell you that the main reason, the patient's health is important than the baby. That is the main reason. So, that's why unnecessary investigations, artificial hormones, unnecessary in the surgeries will give the problem to the human health. That every day I am seeing my, my uh, every day, every files I am not at these points my, my, through, my, through my patients. Unethical practices of allopathic medical criticism. Adverse effects of supranormal doses of hormones, for hormones. False hopes to the patients. Low percentage of success of tuberculosis and in vitro fertilization. High cost treatments out of reach for some couples. Legal status of embryos fertilized and non transferred. IVFs have higher percentage of multiple pregnancies leading to medical so social problems for their family. Physiological impact anxious to conceive creates and worsened material discord. Clinical depressions degrades among women undergoing infertility treatment similar to these with cancer or heart disease. Medications like steroids and antifungals known to cause infertility. Surgical complications of diagnostic procedures. Birth defects are increased with the use of IVF in general and ICSI special, specifically. Ethical issues. Issues regarding donor examination. Emotional turmoil of father. Emotional turmoil of child. 
lack of parental bonding by children, legal issues regarding property rights, etc., possibility of genetic disorders being transmitted through donor insemination, use of unauthorized donor insemination. Issues regarding surgery, joy of motherhood taken away. Sorry. Issues regarding surrogacy, joy of motherhood taken away, risk of fetal well being due to surrogacy, bioethical dilemmas in commercial surrogacy, emotional bonding between mother and child, treatment steps followed in Siddha system of medicines includes new combination of herbal drugs not available in other systems, aimed, to, uh, aimed at proving a health life and not just in the cure of symptoms. Systems based on Tridosha, that means Vada, Pitta, Kama, this is called Tridosha, human therapy akin to modern endocrinology. System in, into and creates good cultural principles and normal, normal conduct. System based on natural helps and ingredients, rendering new impetus for stimulation for, of active life. Siddha or express they, they for resurrection of the potential of the obstructed filament tubes without any surgery. Use of herbal medicines, lifestyle changes, dietary changes, eating in clay vessels, banana leaves, high fiber, low cholesterol diet, avoid preserved, preserved foods. Personal habits, smoking should be avoided, complete avoidance at all alcohol, Avoidance of recreation drugs use, complete avoidance of extra marital affairs or any other abnormal sexual activities. Use of cotton garments, particularly in urban, regularly regular exercise in the form of walking or jogging. Siddha medication plus balanced diet and good habits will give natural pregnancy. This is the Siddha system. Treatment of modelers. Reference Indian medical plants. This is the Indian medicine plant. So many, nearly 2,000 plants are there, and to, uh, about 3,000 medicines are there. Some uh, because of time, so uh, some uh, photos only. All the above mentioned points are. Rationally proven and not many, not many blind beliefs. Bioethical dilemmas one: A 36 years old lady and her husband consulted for infidelity in a major South Indian hospital. Investigations revealed sperm count abnormality in the husband. Age sperm gap. Underwent artificial insemination with husband's sperms. Conceived and delivered a boy baby. DNA, DNA testing after one year revealed no partner links. Investigations reveal patient underwent donor donor insemination without consent at hospital. Legal opinion sought at has filed uh, has filed failed filed offer, has filed for divorce. Future of the child. Bioethical dilemmas to a 32 and 30 years old couple sought consultation for male factor infertility. They already had a child through artificial insemination by donor. Father expressed a desire for a one child. Underwent endogenous treatment for male factor infertility. Successful spontaneous conception delivered a healthy baby. Father now shuns the earlier child from a child from AID. Biethical dilemma 3. A 35 and 32 years old couple with female factor infertility, blocked fellow fruit tubes, assured of 100% success with IVF. Sold his house to mobilize money for the IVF. Was not successful in conception by IVF. Heartbroken and homeless and health spoiled, no home and no issues. <laughs> Bioethical level was 4. I will uh, 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 finish it clearly. 44 years old man, male, 42 years old female sought consultation for male factors for male factor infidelity. Received treatment for 2 years with herbal medicine. Male factor infertility resolved, but wife had a menopause after two years. Husband wants to remarry. Now, should the man pass law? <laughs> Bioethical dilemmas 5. A 33, 20 
eight years old couple with male factor infertility consulted at ERP practitioner. They are allopathic doctors, husband and wife. Was started and a regimen of drugs with lot of steroidal injections to promote testosterone. During treatment, a patient developed breath, breath, breathlessness, NYHA class 4, was diagnosed as a case of acute coronary syndrome with severe heart failure. Patient expired despite the situation. Fair patients, Dr. Kandan, he is MD, he is working as a South Indian Hospital, Vijaya Hospital. His age is 33. Number of young heart attacks are on the side due to increase in unethical practice and over dosaging ERPs. A 34 30 years old couple with combined infertility consulted in ERP center. The lady was started with multiple drugs to introduce volation and was tried with ERP methods. After the treatment failed, uh, failed patient developed abdominal distension which gradually increased. Was diagnosed as a case of ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer and breast cancer nowadays increase in women's side because of this is also a reason of uh, excess of the artificial hormones. Incident of ovarian cancer among the patients who are treated with ERPs and the risk and risk are never, risk, uh, never explained to the patient beforehand in the most centers. Solutions. The Indian government is in the process of regular regulating ethical practice in and assisted reproductive technique by implementing law. Knowledge levels of patient regarding all available medic medical treatment must improve. Public awareness on resources available for treatment should increase. Doctor-patient relationship to improve with both having a fair view of the situation. Medical practitioner to have a high ethical moral value values. Nowadays, some doctors becoming a business doctors, commercial doctors. That is very bad for the people. Medical practitioners should never advertise in media, government partner, patients should only after health information. In our place also, they are taking two half an hour slack in TV and they telecast uh, unbelievable things. Uh, we are doing like that, we are doing, we are increasing 200 years or so, Ayush, like that they are uh, giving the advertisement, it's not good. Some case histories are there, shall I continue, simple? Mm, no? Stop. Okay. Go quickly. One only case, Mr. Jodi Swaran, ASS Pomia, HSC Normal Study, considered on 2015, with the histories also there, there is no time, that's why. I oh. next one both fellow tips block. Just tell me. This. Oh, this is thank you. Kam Kamesh Kalewani. Very severe oligosphomia, both tubes blocks. She delivered on 2013. Okay. So I will remove all these things. And I will last. Uh, I will One doctor, Sai Gita. She is a MBBS and DGO for both philosophy tubes blog. She underwent nearly three IVF for infection. The fellow should you brew and now she delivered normal healthy baby, female baby. Conclusion, there are pros and continues in both systems of medicine. Both of them may have situations that may pose ethical dilemmas. An ideal balance taking the pros of each of the systems should be followed and Indian system of medi medicine has more when it comes to ethical practice and bioethics, patient's care is at most importance. First, do no harm. This is a progress. Thank you. And one, only one word I want to tell you. Different medical systems are something, uh, whatever, whatever the medical system are there, some good things are there. We selected the doctor's duty is the selected which is the best system, which is the best system for problems, for disease, 
they selected the different types of uh, medical system and uh, they, are, they are taking the unity of the Siddha system and allopathic system and Ayurvedic system. The problem is, the main the, mainly the problem is to cure the uh, pro, uh, patients will be satisfied to cure the disease. That is, that is the main system. So that's why the, I submit these papers. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an excellent presentation. Uh, is there a question? Uh, you presented so many cases. <coughs> it's also great to have you speaking. So, I am short out because of yeah. the time is very less. That's why Thank so you. many patients is uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to guess not. You have your own, she said it, but you have your own hospital where yeah. people come huh? and consult. Yeah. She is our hospital for giving treatment. Oh. Yes, yes I am running my own hospital. In Federated Hospital, nearly 35 years onwards. My, my experience is 35 years. How many children you produce every year? He wants every to know. year, uh, last uh, first uh, it's very low. Now it's reaching 15,000 babies. I, oh. I told you no. Sure. And uh, the uh, various countries also. Uh, Belgium. Uh, now recently, Belgium uh, one lady delivered a female baby. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone Any questions? Any other questions? No questions, sir. But uh, I think my presentation is very nice, very good. No, it's very good. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know. Thank you, thank you. It's very good. I must be honest. Very informative. You want to do that? Yeah. I will give you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, no, now just know that. Okay. She'll bring it. Yeah. Okay. So now the uh, doctor, the uh, the Arjun Rathod, are present. So just at night time. circumcision in the Philippines and uh, Kantian ethics. So uh, here's my, uh, <clears throat> I'm Alan G. Natividad from uh, University of the City, City, sorry, City of Manila, and uh, uh, also known as Pamantasan and Nunsad ng Manila. And here's a, a summary of my, uh, 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 rather the abstract. The discussion, uh, uh, the discussion focuses on the ethics of male circumcision, or we call it tuli in, uh, in Filipino, in relation to the notion of personal autonomy. The, uh, I would like to argue that circumcision of male children in the Philippines is morally wrong. That's basically the only argument that I have. And it should be postponed, postponed until such time that the individual is capable of uh, deciding independently. Okay. Now, the paper will be pursued first through uh, the discussion of uh, circumcision as a religious right and socially accepted norms, and then through the discussion of the notion of personal uh, uh, autonomy. It is, uh, I will argue uh, as well that the procedure has some infractions in the Immanuel Kant's uh, formula for autonomy, or the third formulation of the categorical imperative. Uh, in conclusion, I will argue that circumcision of male children is morally wrong. 
tool. Let me have this one first. Uh, uh, circumcision. Uh, okay. Uh, also known as tuli in uh, in Philippine language, is a known tradition for boys in the Philippines and considered to be a rite passage for manhood, or perhaps a symbol of manhood for Filipino boys. So uh, the average uh, age bracket of boys being circumcised in the Philippines uh, is more or less 8 to 12 years old. And uh, report says that more than 90% undergo such procedure. So uh, basically uh, more than 90% are of Filipino male are circumcised. It is really a tradition to us. Okay. The process would involve uh, removal of the foreskin or the tissue covering the head of the penis. Okay. Oh, historically, the procedure has been a practice in the country long before the, the, the arrival of uh, the Christianity in the 16th century. Okay. Uh, the practice is due to the influence of the Muslim community. Mm. And the uh, procedure is carried out through popok. They, they call it popok in Filipino language. Okay, boys are asked to swim into the river to soften the foreskin and asked to chew guava leaves. Then afterwards, uh, the, uh, the person who will do the circumcision uh, uses uh, a blade and then the, the child would have to uh, sit down in a little chair and then, of course, the the blade would cut the the foreskin. That was uh, that was that tradition, and it would be like that picture. Then, uh, but nowadays, uh, circumcision uh, is made in uh, small clinics and hospitals. Yeah, but it would seem like at a public hospital that everyone is actually in line. Okay. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> circumcision has some uh, religious significance in the Islam and Judaism. For Muslim, uh, uh, for the Muslim community, the procedure is based on the on sana, uh, the saying and practices of the Prophet. Although male circumcision is mentioned in the Quran, the the practice was considered uh, to be an ancient tradition. Circumcision is mentioned also in the Hadith as one of the signs of fitra or the natural inclination of humans along with the clipping of nails, removal of hairs in the armpits and genitals and trimming of the mustache. For the Jewish community, uh, circumcision, uh, circumcision rite is one of the most uh, ancient practices. Accordingly, unless one is circumcised, one cannot be saved. So circumcision is uh, actually def defined in uh, Genesis and it states that it is a symbolic act of the covenant with, with God. On the other hand, for, uh, for the Christianity, circumcision has no uh, religious significance. Uh, as uh, defined by St. Paul, the, the Apostle, circumcision should not be taken to be contrary to the teaching of Christ, neither with the whole Christian faith. Because uh, for uh, the Christian, uh, the covenant with God is nothing but faith and uh, the redeeming grace of uh, Jesus Christ. The practice is quite prevalent uh, due to uh, its cultural implications. Uh, in the country, the process uh, of circumcision is a sign of uh, manliness. So you're not actually a man if you're not circumcised. So. Uh, Boys have to undergo the process to conform with the Filipino custom. There is a stigma for those who will not subject to the procedure, such as they, 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 they call it support or uncircumcised in English. Uh, but that is actually a shame for, for boys. Uh, so uh, this poses uh, pressure to males to conform to the cultural practice of circumcision. Uh, maybe that would be uh, the reason why parents uh, force their children to, to undergo the, the procedure. Okay, but is it really an obligation now? Uh, uh, for the Judaism, okay, uh, circumcision is a religious obligation for the Jewish newborn babies. 
Uh, the rite is one of the most ancient practice, as I've said before. Uh, it's uh, a covenant with God, but uh, in the modern times, uh, uh, the Jewish community questioned the practice of, of this rite, and they began to question its inconsistencies to the Jewish law prohibiting harm to, to living things. They claim that <clears throat> since circumcision produced uh, procedure produces harm to children, then the act must be prohibited. And then for, for the Muslim, uh, uh, it is one common right for the community, but, uh, but uh, and the main reason for, uh, for this procedure is for uh, cleanliness purposes. So it is essential that every Muslim washes before praying, uh, they, they say. And it is important that no urine is left on the body. So uh, circumcision is not, although circumcision is not obligatory in the Islam, yet done to purify oneself. Yeah. Some Muslims also believe that circumcision is part of the uh, fitra, or the common sensical or natural way for personal deportment together with the trimming of moustache. Um, and for the, the Christian, uh, for the Christian community, uh, the Christian community challenges the whole idea of circumcision. Okay, uh, accordingly, it has a conflict with the Christian faith. There are uh, quite several passages in the Bible that can be read as uh, it is not essential uh, at all. Okay, so maybe, maybe I would have to read one passage uh, that uh, would uh, actually tell us that it is quite uh, in conflict, conflict with the Christian uh, religion. Uh, it says here in Corinthians uh, 12, uh, 28 in the, in the Bible, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. Okay. What is important then in the Christian religion uh, is, circum uh, is the circumcision in spirit. Uh, as uh, St. Paul vehemently opposed the act of circumcision and states that circumcision is unprofitable. Thus, in Christian faith, one is not obligated in to be circumcised. But for most Filipinos, as part of the culture, circumcision, uh, if not all, circumcision is carried out uh, out of the, their, uh, of the custom. A report says that more than 90% are, of males are circumcised. Failure to, to be circumcised create, creates stigma and, and subject the person into public ridicule. Parents usually force their children to undergo such procedure in order to avoid the stigma. Uh, parents find it's necessary for their son to undergo such procedure for, to be able for them to, to adapt socially. Uh, in order to gain social acceptance and address social pressure, boys are forced to undergo circumcision. Thus, it would appear that boys are obliged to undergo such procedure. Uh, other than the uh, social uh, acceptance in, in, in the Philippines, parents also believe that the procedure is said to have some health benefits that's needed to be performed to protect their children. Okay, government even provides annual, uh, uh, annual uh, program or the Oakland circumcision e e every year, uh, every summer actually. Uh, it is claimed that circumcision reduces uh, 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 the risk of cancer, uh, urinary tract infections, um, what else? Uh, and even HIV. Uh, study shows, according to the American uh, Academic and, uh, of Pediatrics, that circumcision provides protection against the spread of syphilis. Also, circumcised male are, are less uh, likely to become infected of, uh, uh, with HIV. That is actually the, the, the claim. However, uh, the uh, American Academic Pediatrics is quite uncertain how circumcision 
prevent the, 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 the said diseases. Thus, further researches have to be have to be made. Okay, let me now uh, proceed to the the notion of uh, autonomy. Now, in, in Kant's uh, third formulation of the categorical imperative, uh, it says that the third practical principle follows from the first two of the ultimate condition of their harmony with practical reason. The idea is. The will of every rational being is universally legislating will. And this would entail that an agent is said to be autonomous if, if the action emanates from oneself and independent and free from any external control. So uh, my argument then would entail that, okay, so there are actually violation of personal autonomy with this circumcision and a violation of physical integrity. Yeah. Kant's third formulation of categorical imperative gives emphasis on the individual's capacity for self-determination and governance. It assumes that the individual must will uh, maxims that are universally and self-governed. In that manner, action must be must not intrude self freedom and the freedom of others by allowing agents uh, to decide rationally on their own body. One actually respects autonomy. The idea is to respect individuals' uh, autonomy. Intuitively, there seems to be a violation with the act of circumcision uh, of male, for it does not really respect personal autonomy. Uh, as rational agent, one has a moral autonomy over one's action. Autonomy is a major principle in making decisions over oneself or another. But in case of children, there is no question that they are not completely capable of judging independently. The capacity to decide is really left on their parents. Uh, autonomy... Uh, the, the, the authority of parents over their children is assumed by virtue that their desire for the best interest of their children. In, in the case of circumcision of, of male children, it is widely known in the country that parents have their full autonomy over their children. So uh, in most cases in the Philippines, parents force their children to undergo circumcision procedure because uh, uncircumcised boys end up being bullied uh, by their peers. So males who do not uh, who do not undergo circumcisions are actually embarrassed, being embarrassed as well. So yet, uh, on the other hand, mm -hmm, uh, being circumcised is something that every man should be proud of in the Philippines. To be able to, to adapt in this uh, norm, parents find it necessary for their son to undergo circumcision procedure to uh, be able for them to adapt socially. Okay, on the... Maybe please uh, round, okay. round up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there seems to be a reservation for, uh, to, for uh, the circumcision process. Parents should only be allowed to decide of, on, for, on medical issues for diagnosis and treatment of the diseases. Non-essential procedures should be delayed until child become mature enough to, to decide. Uh, this is actually supported by uh, the international human rights law. And uh, accordingly, circumcision of male children violates the provision of various international human rights instrument and must be considered an ethical, and, uh, med uh, an ethical medical practice. And then another one is uh, yeah, uh, on the physical integrity. Okay, uh, it gives emphasis on autonomy over one's own body. Uh, and uh, protection of one's own body against others. Let the, uh, I would like uh, everyone to to understand that it, 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 it should be like that the person has to decide genuinely with all rationality what it is to be done with their own body. Yeah, uh, in, in, uh, in turn. Okay, we need to. Okay. Stop. Yeah, my conclusion would be uh, the procedure undermines autonomy, thus rendering the act to be morally wrong yeah and uh, my recommendation then would be like this one 
stop child circumcision until they reach the, the age of majority where they can really decide on their own and capable of understanding the notion of self-governance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if we have time for one question. Yes, sir. It's, I, I don't think there is any urgent reason for any man to be circumcised as a cultural thing. When I was in Sweden, uh, males from the gym, when they take the shower, they would show, uh, take their clothes off, and no one was circumcised. Yes. And so if it were me who would be taking my clothes off, I would be the one who would be ashamed. Yes. So it's, I suppose it's a cultural thing, and I think that's correct. It violates the autonomy of, yes. the, of the child. Especially, for instance, if there are children who have autism, and parents sometimes, because of this cultural thing, yes. parents should understand that there is really no reason for them to, to have their kids circumcised. Thank you, sir. Paul, oh, thank you very much. So I think you've convinced us. Thank you. So we'll be presenting uh, the implementation of technology security and the development of implementation of security at St. Paul University, Quezon City. Um, so background for the study. With regards to technology security, who is responsible for securing an organization's information? Is it the IT officer? Is it the security officer? Or it, it is um, all employees in the organization. Recently, the National Privacy Commission in the Philippines um, released a circular which states that um, all organization and offices needs uh, registration of the data processing systems and notifications regarding the automated decision making. So this circular is from the Republic Act 1073, which states that an act protecting the individual personal information in information communication systems in the government and private sector. So upon the registration of data processing systems and notifications regarding the automated decision systems, it states that the sectors or institutions provided therein that are processing personal data and operating in the country are subject to mandatory registration. The deadline of this is last, um, last October. So all other processing or PICS or the uh, personal information processor should register if the company or the institution employs at least 250 persons or processing at least 1,000 records involving sensitive personal information. So with this um, um, law or public act, so it affects most of the universities and hospitals because most of the universities and hospitals, we, have, uh, we are the institution that handles most records that has sensitive um, information. So on section 2 of the Republic Act, it also states that, or known as the Data Privacy Act, provides that it is the policy of the state to protect the fundamental human right of privacy of communication while ensuring free flow of information to promote innovation and growth. The state also recognizes its inherent obligation to ensure that the personal information and information communication systems in the government and in the private sector are secure and protected. So, what made the Philippine government um, try to have this mandatory registration? So, there are, from the past three years, there are many cases of data breach, especially in, in some other countries and in the Philippines. So in a university, potential sensitive data from organization, which includes personal data of students or staff held by the institution, or certain types of information such as research for commercial or political means, are the usual target. So from 10 years ago, um, there are many, uh, there are some cases of data breaches, but unlike three years or three years ago, Many companies, many institutions have cases of data breach, especially sensitive data. 
So the goal of security is to protect the information in the system without unnecessarily limiting its utility. However, the system should be so secure that authorized users can't get to data they need to do their job. So while policies themselves don't solve problems and in fact can actually complicate things unless they are clearly written and observed, policy does define the ideal toward which all organization efforts should uh, point. So the Philippine government, through the Department of Information and Communications Technology, mandate, uh, mandates to establish cybersecurity measures that would guard the country against cyber threats. In the U.S., for example, for the first few months of 2016, there had been a 50% increase in higher education breaches. Southern New Hampshire University, let's say 140,000 records, including student names, email addresses, and IDs, course names, set, etc., to the third-party vendor configuration error. University of Central Florida, for example, 63,000 records due to unauthorized access. The data compromise included financial, medical grades, and social security numbers. The university provided one-year free credit monitoring for those affected. So there were few reported cases of higher education data breaches in the Philippines. In the reports, government agencies are usually the target. However, that does not mean that this issue must be disregarded. So this is the framework that we use on adapting a new uh, in policy and procedure in the information technology in protecting data. So we have the checklist from physical security, information security, software security, user access security, network and internet security, plus the awareness of the respondents um, in the technology security. So the method or the process is we float questionnaires just to get uh, the base or some baseline on the existing um, security or technology security at the St. Paul University, Quezon City. Because until now, um, users are considered still the weakest link. We users are considered still the weakest link. So the output of this would be recommended policies and programs on technology security and um, uh, for implementation. So the questionnaire are consists of 187 uh, items, which is divided into six areas, like introductory security, physical security, information security, software security, user access security, and network security. Like for example, for information security, this refers to the protection of information in order to achieve confidentiality and availability. For the network and internet security, this is the protection of access to the files and directories in a computer network against hacking, misuse, and unauthorized changes to the system. For the physical security, this refers to the protection of building uh, sites and equipment from theft, vandalism, natural disaster, man-made catastrophes, and accidental damage. For software security, this refers to programs installed on the computer that protect against hackers or viruses. And the user access security is a way of limiting access to a system or to a physical or virtual resources. Because by next year, by May or June of 2018, all companies, private and government, are required to submit their new security policies and procedure to the National Data Privacy Commission. For example, I have a student records. So I will put on a policy on who are the people have access to the student records? What are the informations that we get from our students? Are those informations that we get are useful or are we to use that from the day-to-day -day operations? If it's not, then we need to eliminate that from the registration form. So that is one statement under the Data Privacy Act. So for the result, my colleague, Ms. Marites Montanilla, will present the the result. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We're going to have the results in the second part. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, it'll be a two-part. 
So we're going to have the HIGO students to present now, uh, please, uh, talking about euthanasia. Uh, and then you're going to all introduce yourself. And then we'll do the second part of the results uh, after. Okay? Please, uh, could we have all the students come up so they can show you, introduce themselves? And I think only some are presenting, but we have a few the students here. the year PhD course student of pharmaceutical sciences in Kumamoto University. Good evening everyone. My name is Dr. Izine Okoro. I am third year doctoral course public health, Department of Public Health in Kumamoto University. Uh, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Sao I come from China. Now I'm a, a grade three doctor course student in the medical school of, of Kumamoto University. Now we'd like to talk about mistaken diagnosis in euthanasia. This is, this is table of contents that we discuss. First of all, I explain the definition of euthanasia. Euthanasia is intentionally bringing about the death by act or omission in as painless a way as practical, practical of a person by at least one other person where the person who death is occasion is or will be suffering. The suffering is or will be prolonged or irremediable and the primary motive for the act or omission is to prevent or eliminate the suffering. Euthanasia can be classified into six types. First, voluntary euthanasia is the euthanasia which is done by behest of patients who is suffering in pain desire. Second, non-voluntary euthanasia is the euthanasia which is done when the person suffering is or has been unable to express her desire clearly. Third, in Voluntary euthanasia is the euthanasia which is done against the expressed desire of a competent sufferer. In addition, these three types of euthanasia can be divided into two types, active or passive. Passive euthanasia is the euthanasia leading leads patient to death in initially by injection of lethal drug. Passive euthanasia is the euthanasia is stopping or withdrawing the life-sustaining treatment to release per patient from suffering of treatment. Now, euthanasia is typically considered in a patient suffering from a serious, especially terminal illness. The Netherlands uh, Netherlands and Belgium and Luxembourg also like euthanasia under certain conditions. The Netherlands is the first country to legalize euthanasia. This Netherlands law allows medical, medical level board to suspend prosecution of doctors who perform euthanasia when each of these conditions in this presentation, we focus on the patient condition which is unbearable and treat, treat untreatable suffering. And in this uh, suffering means 
uh, the patient with not only physical pain but also mental suffering. In the law, there are limitations and weak points. That is, uh, it's difficult for doctor to diagnose unbearable suffering, especially with mental pain and untreatable suffering. There is a possibility that this judgment would, would cause mistaken diagnosis. The law doesn't cover mistaken diagnosis situation and may overlook euthanasia by mistaken diagnosis. Do we need to consider mistaken diagnosis in the law? So, uh, along the so along with the uh, approval of the uh, law in euthanasia. And uh, I uh, more and more countries. So this is this has been widespread around the world. So on the other hand, however, the diagnosis by the doctor for euthanasia is never valid. So what's the uh, the doctor di diagnosis is uh, true or wrong cannot be judged. On the other hand, in the clinic practice the doctor's diagnosis could not be uh, could not be true uh, the diagnostic rate is not 100% correct so this should be considered when in the uh, in euthanasia when we considered about mistaken diagnosis so uh, this figure is from a uh, clinic from hospital it shows that the uh, mistaken diagnosis rate in uh, intensive care unions. So the black bar shows the total number for autopsies and the uh, gray, gray, uh, gray bar shows the identified mistaken diagnosis case. So in average, the mistaken diagnosis rate in the ICU uh, intensive care unions is around 28%, so very high. And these diagnosis errors cause uh, around 10% of patient deaths and around uh, 6 to 17% of adverse events in the hospital. So because uh, mistaken diagnosis occurs in general practice, uh, clinic practice, this is also true for uh, the case in euthanasia. This is one one example. Uh, the left side, uh, this la old lady, she was diagnosed as uh, with uh, um, operative cancer in 2000, and uh, she lived in Oregon of the United States. So when she was heard, he, she was diagnosed with um, op operative cancer, she uh, discharged treatment. So. This, this behavior is uh, regarded as a uh, give up treatment mm -hmm. and uh, uh, regarded as uh, she has only about six months to one year to live. So it was fit the organ uh, death with diligent uh, dignity role. And uh, the left side is one of her doctor. This doctor uh, didn't agree with uh, her opinion and uh, make effort to uh, encourage her to go on treatment and she uh, finally changed her mind. So what happened? After treatment, this old lady had now already uh, lived for more than 10 years and now she is uh, celebrating her birthday. So this is one case of uh, uh, physical euthanasia, mistaken diagnosis in physical uh, um, pain. So another main reason for euthanasia is uh, what we call mental pain or mental illness. So this is also a, a very important uh, reason for euthanasia. And currently, uh, Bertram and uh, the North is uh, uh, currently is a uh, is uh, uh, two country where uh, euthanasia uh, as a reason of mental pain 
is a load. The idea is that uh, mental pain should be considered as the same as uh, physical pain. So people uh, or patients who are suffering from mental illness also have the right to uh, for euthanasia. As, a, uh, as qualified for the uh, euthanasia, uh, there is one criteria. It uh, states that patients uh, who have unbearable or untreatable suffering could uh, is uh, one important criteria for euthanasia. However, on the other hand, uh, this criteria is very difficult to judge on the case of uh, mental pain. Even for the uh, famous doctors, famous uh, uh, euthanasia advocate, for example, in this case, the doctor said, you cannot see the pain, their pain. You cannot judge by uh, the me method, by techniques on the scan. You, what you can do is only to listen to the patient, they are, uh, they are, uh, they are listen to what they, they said. This kind of uh, opinion actually in true is uh, not always true. So doctors have difficulty to judge whether this uh, mental pain is correct or not. So. This leads to uh, confusing and even uh, disagreement between doctors. So th this is one unpublished letter, letters between doctors. Uh, actually, is uh, who against? Uh, it is from the uh, chairperson of the euthanasia community who against another doctor uh, about the criteria. His judgment is that the, he think. The criteria for another doctor to conduct euthanasia is right or wrong. So, it, so from this case, you can find that uh, regarding mental pain, the criteria is very, very difficult. So, this this difficulties in judgment could contribute to mis mistaken diagnosis. So, in clinic, uh, to prevent or de to decrease the rate of missing diagnosis, there is some uh, framework. This is one example. Uh, it's called the Safer DX framework. So this framework focusing on uh, at first focusing on the initial di diagnosis by by a doctor, and also it's focusing on the follow up after the first diagnosis. There is a follow up. And they, they, uh, it also encourages the use of uh, multi techniques to uh, help doctor for be uh, better diagnosis. After the diagnosis procedure, there is a uh, feedback, feedback to the regulatory uh, stakeholders to uh, or to the place makers to ensure a better diagnosis. Um, uh, lower rate of missing diagnosis. So this is one example of uh, what we can do in the clinic uh, by a uh, framework. Another uh, possible solution is by using high tech technologies. For example, using of, uh, this, this is an example for using of AI in hospital for the improvement of the diagnostics accuracy in Boston. So it it could uh, it it, it report that the diagnosis accuracy could be into uh, increased to ninety six percent. So it is very high by using high technology. So <coughs> our purpose is that so um, by use of uh, techniques to objective uh, predict the to help the diagnosis, it is possible to. Decrease the of decrease the rate of missing diagnosis. First, uh, our example is first the use of artificial intelligence learning to analysis of CT scans. Secondary is the uh, objective measurement of physical pain. The first uh, we think uh, is a clinic. So um, by using a uh, uh, cross section. Scans. It is possible to detect uh, 
pathophilia physiology uh, at the early stage, and uh, by con con combining uh, AI deep learning to these CT scans, it is uh, possible to uh, pre predict longevity. Secondly, uh, by objectively measure of the physical pain by using uh, functional MRI, we can uh, we can better judge uh, uh, we can better uh, judge of physical pain and we can separate physical pain and uh, mental pain. So these are two examples how we can objectively uh, uh, judge the physical pain. So. As a conclusion, it is possible. Uh, we found that it is possible to predict, to prevent mistaken diagnosis, uh, to avoid uh, euthanasia by the pro progress of techniques. So this progress of techniques could help us to object to uh, uh, di uh, to uh, accelerate the diagnosis rate. However, on the other hand. Uh, because mental illness is uh, difficult to uh, judge, and so this it could be one main reason for mistaken diagnosis in euthanasia. Thank you. Can I talk the mic? Okay, uh, great job. Thank you very much. Can I ask, uh, what's the situation of euthanasia in your own countries? Uh, yeah, so, I come from China. Okay. So, currently, the euthanasia is uh, not allowed, is not approved by the law in China. So, it is uh, not uh, allowed. Secondly, uh, although it is not allowed, uh, people People's attitude on euthanasia has uh, changed. Previously, it is, uh, it is people didn't agree with euthanasia, or they didn't understand, and uh, or they didn't uh, talk about it because uh, it, it is our tradition. But currently, more and more people people uh, approved euthanasia. This is uh, the situation in China. In Japan, there are no accident specific provisions of official guidelines on euthanasia. But recently, um, official guidelines on dignity, uh, death with dignity has been made. In Japan, this death with dignity is a widely known term that is distinguished from euthanasia. It is generally defined as the act of letting a terminal ill or a patient in a persistent vegetative state die with, uh, by withdrawing life sustaining treatment and requesting the home of a living will. So um, in Nigeria currently, Indonesia is considered as mother because in our various cultures, we have a lot of sayings that promote life. So we say a lot of things like, um, it is better to be in the land of the living, it is better to be alive. And we say things like, um, in Hebrew, it's certain to be see, which means life is the most important thing. So as long as that person, as, as much as we can, keep the person alive. So it is still um, a criminal act to promote or carry out the act of euthanasia, even if you have the consent of the person. Okay, thank you. That's very informative. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, Marlon, thank you. Um, I wonder why a misdiagnosis for euthanasia is not happening when I think there are only three countries in the world with national law that allows euthanasia. That's uh, Netherlands, Belgium, and Switzerland. Uh, it may have been practiced in the US, but it is not a national policy. 
uh, law by law. All others are generally adamant in creating a national law that legalizes abortion, ah, sorry, euthanasia, that legalizes euthanasia. Now, your study is about uh, misdiagnosis in euthanasia, right? Yes. Are you saying that if proper diagnosis is done, euthanasia can be recommended? Oh, no. No, the point here is that mistaken diagnosis is one of the reasons why euthanasia may be higher. Now, in the case of a patient who is suffering, and most patients at that time are not in their right senses in quotes, sorry. And so because of the unbearable suffering, in the face of euthanasia, the patient will say, please, let okay. me have it and end my So story. it's the mistaken diagnosis that causes patients to repress euthanasia, not the uh, mistaken yes. diagnosis that, you know, yes. that was, that's why they came in. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, probably uh, you can add in your study the 21, <laughs> for all people, the EAPC, the European Association of Palliative Care. I think I'm not, I'm not mistaken. Uh, last year, they they made a statement that euthanasia should not be a part included in palliative care. Normally, the I want to hold uh, the next seminar uh, here. Uh, the tubes to arrive by the six and nine of the table. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, all the part participants and all the staffs, uh, and uh, goodbye uh, for the present. And uh, we hope uh, all of you uh, join the next round time. Thank you very much. Findings of the research that we conducted to in order to um, comply or to um, address the the mandate of the Philippine government about um, RA 101.73, so we conducted a research um, taking a look into how are we going to be able to make our um, technology secure in St. Paul University, Quezon City. So once again, when we talk about te technology security, we are addressing or we uh, would like to focus on the following. So the five areas. We have the physical, we have the information security, software security, user access security, and network security. So it has been said that computer security and ethics are related in the sense that the observation of established computer ethics will lead to increased computer security. So ethics for computers is used to describe the philosophical principles of rights and wrongs in relation to the use of computers. Computer security, on the other hand, refers to the security or lack of security of both personal and commercial computers. So that's why uh, if we look into the security of the technology in a particular organization or um, in as a whole, um, ethics is always related to that. So we have this questionnaire, which we base from the National Center for Education Statistics. So this list um, of items that we need to check regarding those um, category earlier that was mentioned um, is used by the U.S. and the other nations in order to collect, analyze, and report data related to education. So we adopt that um, list of items in checking where are we in terms of implementing, in terms of 
observing those different items. So we started with um, the key offices in the organization which holds the confidential data, so such as the registrar's office, the office of the deans, the office of the vice president for academics and the like, those offices that um, keep confidential data. So okay, once again, um, we would like to find out the what particular item from the list. The reason why we have introductory security is that we would like to look into what um, does our specific organization need to focus into when it comes to securing our technology. So that's why we have also a list of items uh, which we categorize or we have uh, called as introductory security. So based on this one, we will know what are the specific needs or what are the specific items that need to be um, addressed in the organization. So in the physical security, so we would like to check whether the building and the equipment is protected. It's part of the list. So to summarize the list of the items that we have in this category, so it talks about the reliable power supplies, the adequate climate control, and appropriate um, protection from intruders. So for the information security, we would like to talk into how the employees value confidentiality and how do they uh, give importance to creating and using their username and passwords when um, entering into the system. So for the software security, so we would like to check whether they are aware if the software that are installed in our computers are licensed and we would like to find out whether they are aware as well if the system that we are using is controlled by the ICT or the Information and Communications Technology Office. For the network security, we would like to know whether they are aware or they know or in their end, um, how do uh, they look into the access points in the system that they are using in their respective offices? Is it secured? Are restricted sites blocked? The cabling and wiring are secured. So these are the findings. So for the introductory security, we uh, would want to give emphasis or we would like to address the following because these items from the list of items that they rated got the <coughs> rating that um, is towards the lower um, scale. So meaning to say it's either they are not sure whether this is being implemented or they uh, are totally not aware. So staffs, so for this one, uh, got a rating that is towards the lower side of the scale. Staffs receive security training tailored to their needs. Security issues are included in the employee performance reviews. Security policies are reviewed annually at the minimum. Security activities are monitored. A security breach response is in place. That's under the introductory security. For the physical security, so we would like to focus on this one in terms of creating the policies and um, rules and regulations. Equipment are housed out of sight and reach from doors. Up-to-date records of all equipment, brand names, and serial numbers are kept in secure location. Security staffs are required to maintain a log of all equipment taken in and out of secure areas. And interruptible power supplies are in place for critical systems. Information security, we have magnetic media that contains sensitive information property are cleaned before you reuse or disposal. Backups of critical software and information are maintained in secure facilities at an off-site location. For the user access security, so the opening screen 
is clear and specific about the organization's expectations of the users. The opening screen as well requires the user to accept the conditions of monitoring and punishment before proceeding. The system admin changes all preset and package passwords. Network security stops communicate security concerns immediately. All system access points are secured. All cabling and wiring are secured. Restrict sites are blocked by the firewall. Devices can freely connect to the SPUQC network from the outside. Downloading of movies from torrent sites are accessible or are possible. So what are the implications of the study that we have? So we all know that many schools, school districts, state education, Agencies and colleges and universities now use technology to manage student, staff, and administrative records. The safeguarding electronic information is not as simple as assigning a technical staff person to verify that the system is protected. So the top level administrators should invest time and expertise to develop a well-conceived comprehensive and customized security policies. Commitment and authority is required for the top administrator to implement the policies to the entire organization. So this research would want to convey that increasing information security is both necessary and achievable task, and it is a must to do for organizations as well as the right thing to do for uh, students, parents, staffs, and communities. So, since we already have a policy in place, but as part of our recommendation, we would like to conduct technology security awareness to stakeholders. We train and train the staff of all the and all the employees. Review and update. So, since we have a lot of changes in our uh, information technology, so we also have to update the existing policies and procedures just to comply with the RA 10173 and other um, security, technology security policies and procedures and consider a privacy impact assessment to information systems to test the integrity and um, confidentiality of the information. So it has been said that the same technology that can be the source of so much concern when in the hands of untrained users can actually be used to protect information more securely than ever before imaginable if it is used wisely. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Tamami. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tomomi Watanabe, now from University of Science and Technology, Department of Applicated Japanese Assistant Professor. And this is my first English presentation. My major is Chinese Literature, so <laughs> And this is my first biological presence. <laughs> Can Pulso please on this road urban donors considering some cases in China and Taiwan? Organ transplantation is legal in the United States, but in 2011, an Oregon death row, <coughs> death row inmate named Christian Lobo Costa Star when he mounted an aggressive behind bears campaign to donate his organs after execution and the campaign was featured in New York Times. His request to drop his appeals in exchange for being allowed to donate organs was denied from the viewpoint of morality and ethics. 
after all. In China, organ transplantation from death row inmates had been performed until it was delegitimated in 2015, and the same thing had, had been happened with Taiwan in 2014. I'm going to introduce the background of the law, legal change, and what we can learn from it. China has never enacted a fundamental law concerning plant donation from death row inmates. However, the Supreme People's Court of the Court of, of the People's Republic of China and the Supreme People's Procurate of the People's Republic of China issues the act of temporary measures concerning the uses of death row inmates' bodies and organ in December 1984, which allowed organ donation from death row inmates on the following conditions. One, the inmate has no relative to claim or her body. Two, the inmate relative refuses to claim his or her body. Three, the inmate spontaneously offers his or her organ. Four, the inmate relative gave their consent to other. The number of donors is extremely smaller than that of patients who need organ transplants in China, and that, that is one reason why this low inmate organs have been needed and concluded. As many researchers before, Chinese people has been reluctant to donate their organs by ideological reasons. According to Zhou Hu's research, a father of Jiangsu farmer named Amistak Fu committed suicide, claiming that the cold so Both sold his son's body to a hospital without agreement in May 2000. <laughs> in September of the same year, a mother of a death row inmate named Yu Yonggan from Taiwan City, Shanxi, crime that her son's organs had been taken by the hospital and the court. In 2009, Huang Jiefu, the head of Ministry of Health of the People's Republic of China, reported that 65% of organ donors were death row inmates. This number was bigger than Fosin and Essex as well, well as jurists all over the country spoke their various opinions until the daily dimension in 2015. The pros are one, the partitions interests and the effective utilization of the organs. Two, organ donation as opportunity of the immense good deeds or redemption. Three, 
respect for the death law in made decisions. The cause are one, effect compulsion to medical practitioners negligence. Three, humanistic issues. Four, including frequency of death sentence. In Taiwan, Dr. Zhu Xu Xu, the chair of the Transplantation Society of Taiwan, worries about the shortage of organs for donation and forced Ministry of Justice to change the law concerning death row inmates. Organ donation in 1990. Uh, result, the law was revised so that it can permit death law inmates to offer their organs. If they ask their spouse or relation in the third degree sign the letter of consent in August of the same year. The first organ transplant Presentation was performed at Changzhen Hospital in Kaohsiung County on December 15, 1990. We sparked great controversy in Taiwanese society. <coughs> the controversy became greater than this law inmate come back to life at the hospital after execution January 1991. Furthermore, a foreign human rights organization lodged a protest in November and December 1991. Taiwan Neurological Society as well as Taiwan Society of Anesthetics also launched a protest against organ donation from death row inmates because the determination of a death at execution differs from general brain death criteria. Moreover, some domestic human rights organizations asserted abolition of capital punishment and the ban of death row inmates organ in 2014, organ donation from death row inmates became illegal. However, this fact has not permitted the whole country and the organs of the Taipei subway phantom attacker named John Jie draw people's attention when he has executed in May 2016 after this sentence for murder. Therefore, Li Bo Zhang, the chair of National Health Insurance Administration, had to make, make an official statement that organ transplantation from death row in Wales was banned two years before. Opinions of the supporters and objectors of Internal organs use of the death row in men are so different between Taiwan and China. But the scale is larger in Taiwan than China. Is it possible for this law in men to donate their organs? Isn't the death penalty retribution? Do we have to give them the right to do 
that which might lower their fear of death or lower um, deterrence capability of death sentence. About Rongo's case, author Kaplan says that being an organ donor isn't right but a gift, and that prisoners on death row don't have the right of the of right to be organ donor. Maybe we can say that is a common public opinion as Tai Fu Chan and Wang Shui Xian find Kaplan's reference variable when they, when they consider this low organ donation matter in Taiwan. What we can learn from those cases of Taiwan and China. The problem is they needed to use the death law image organs, organs because of the shortage of organ donation candidates. Their people became distrustful of organ donation from death law image. Because as human rights organizations say, prisoners' rights should be protected to start with. In my opinion, this law inmates offer of organ donation should be embraced if we have the strict law respect the inmates free will and the organs have no health problem because the inmates have the right of self-determination. I think it's possible for prisoners on death row to be organ donors on the condition that they are respect as human beings and we keep the system as we as the procedure is currently right. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very important topic. Um, are there any questions? So uh, I'm interested that you said you think the problem is more in Taiwan than in China. Um, in mainland China, the execution of political prisoners uh, and organ transplantation by order uh, for commercial services is, is widely reported. Um, but, uh, so followers of uh, Falun Gong, for example, and in fact, we had a session, a workshop in January, in February this year in London, uh, AUSN workshop talking about this. Um, and last year in Japan Association of Bioethics session, we also had a session uh, on this. Um, so you, what is the number of ex, number per year in Taiwan of executed prisoners whose organs, whose bodies are used for organs. Do you have an idea, the number? So she, the practice of banned in 2014. Mm. Mm. 
She can't answer the, yeah, the mm. figures. The figures. So, but in 1991, there was some problem, and then so since then, there are many have critique, a criticism about this practice. Mm. But then, but maybe before that, in the 90s, there are some practices. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, thank you, because it may be the official number may be different. Some of it may be hidden, as in mainland China. It's sort of a hidden number. Yeah. Well, she said in, in mainland China, there, it's also in China, it was also banned, mm. but she found one interesting case in which there are some guy sent his death, his, his, his organ was used for the some son of the one of the top generals. Yeah. So she said maybe there are some political some political hierarchies or political hierarchy of guys might be using this kind of stuff. 